Hey, Engineer Moore. Hello, hello. I hope you're having a good day as well. How's it going? We're going to get started here in about one minute and 30 seconds. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you're trying to be positive. That's a good way to be. Got to roll with the punches, right? Can everybody hear me okay? Is my audio good? Alrighty, thank you more. All right, Aroni, let's go ahead and get started. Hey, EFS. <laughs> hey, Copper Lily, how's it going? All righty. Hi, folks. Good to see everybody. I hope you're having a good Sunday so far. <laughs> Copper Lily says, it's hot. Oh, son of Anton. Hey, welcome to the stream. Good to have you here. Got really, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's hot where I live as well. I have a fan, uh, so I have the door behind me open. It's normally shut, but I have it open so we can try to get some airflow in here. And I have a fan blowing on the back of my legs, so that seems to offset some of the uh, the oppressive heat. Someone turn up the AC outside, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's it's toasty, toasty warm. And I'm not even in an area that's being, that's getting real heat. You know, I'm not in like Arizona or whatever, um, or Texas. <laughs> if I says you fancy. Oh man. Yeah. I think this fan is from like 1965. So, but Hey, it works. So who cares? Right. Alrighty. So what are we doing today? Well, today we are continuing our journey with, uh, sort of the fundamentals of building CRUD apps. Uh, because what I want to do for you guys is I want to give you all um, templates and sort of structures and things that you can build here with me on stream. And then you can take that and you can turn it into, you know, whatever you want, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's a blog app. We're, technically, we're building a blog, but this really doesn't have to be. Um, it, it can be whatever kind of CRUD app you want. You just need to make the modifications to you know, make it do what you want it to do. Uh, and so we're going to essentially be building a, a template for a blogging app. But, you know, in the end, it doesn't have to be. You can take it and you can modify it and you can do whatever the heck you want. Um, that's kind of the goal. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, and we are going to be using React uh, to build this. But if you're not very familiar with React, it's okay. Um, Copper Lily, thank you so much for the sub. Wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and, uh, so yeah, we're going to be building with React, but if you're not very familiar with React, that's okay. Um, this is going to be a very simple app. And I think what you'll find is a lot of the concepts are going to be very similar to the types of CRUD apps that we built. Celia Kelly, thank you so much for the sub. Copper Lily, I don't know why the notification yeah, didn't work for you, but I appreciate you just as much. So thank you, Celia and uh, Copper Lily both. Hey, Mavi, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Gonna make Mazo sell that cowboy hat. Yes. Uh, so one of the goals here on stream is that eventually, maybe, uh, if enough people use their Prime subscriptions, 
uh, we can make Jeff Bezos sell his cowboy hat because Prime subscriptions don't cost you money. They cost Jeff Bezos money and they give it to streamers. So yes, use your, if you have Amazon Prime, use your Prime sub. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to use it on me. I'm not saying that. Go find your favorite streamer and use it on them. Um, and that way you don't have to spend any money. That's always a plus, right? Free things are nice. That's why I do this because I want to give you free things. Um, free templates, free knowledge, whatever. <laughs> free time. Uh. <laughs> yeah, indeed. All right. So yes, we are building a React app today, uh, but it's going to be very simple. Uh, the, the slight twist on some of the other CRUD apps that we've been doing lately is that today we're actually going to be building a separate API and client. So we're going to have two projects that are going to work together. We're going to build an API, which is going to talk to the database, right? We're going to have our, our, our database operations, which are going to be hanging out in our server. And then we're going to build everything else in our front end client, uh, using react. And so, uh, I think you'll see some very, some similarities to the types of product crud apps that we've built before, but, um, it, there's going to be some differences and some maybe some efficiencies that you'll notice uh, that we do when we do this by building React. Blech. When we build this with React. All right, I'm going to hydrate. Hey, Sushi Samurai. Welcome to the stream. Good to have you here. Uh, and as you see, uh, Moobot just posted in chat uh, the code for our uh, both the API and the front end. So. Um, if you get behind, things aren't working, whatever, uh, you can always go to both of those repos and copy whatever code you need. Uh, first one is obviously for our back end, and the second one is for our uh, front end client. Um, and as, if you take a peek at that code, I think you'll see that there's not a ton there. It's, it's, this is going to be a pretty simple app. Uh, we're not going for broke here, not a ton of features, really just trying to build you a foundation that you can use to build other things on top of this. So let's take a look at what we're building. Let's take a quick tour. Um, so very simple. This looks very similar to the, um, to the, the, to the, uh, what did we call that? The, like the kitten store, I think this is probably looks the most similar to, um, the kitten store and, uh, and a little bit like the cat book as well. So, you know, if we're using bootstrap here. It's going to look similar. Um, but it is all React under the hood. So unlike the last couple projects we did, this is not HTML, CSS, JavaScript. This is React. Um, now, if I click on one of these and I say, let's do this one. If I click on one of these and I say, read more, uh, it takes us to like a blog post page. We've got our title, we've got our author, um, and we've got the full text of the blog post. And we also have up here, this is a nice, uh, splash image. Um, this is just a placeholder. This is from a placeholder image site. Um, but this could be powered by whatever image storage you want. You could have it be cloudinary. Um, you could have it just, you know, generate random, nice looking images, whatever you like. Um, so if we go back home, we can do a create post and this allows us to create a new post. Um, and all of this information is being stored in uh, MongoDB. So if we take a peek here, we can see that I have a uh, collect. I have a uh, uh, yeah, a collect. Uh, sorry, a database, and then a, a collect a database with a collection inside of it, uh, and then documents inside of that collection. I forgot the react. I forgot the MongoDB hierarchy there for a second. Gosh, I keep drilling that. That's why I got to keep drilling these. Yep. Um, so I have a React blog here with posts, and then we can see the posts are stored here. And Beyonce asks, uh, hey, will this stream be available after the day? Yes, it will. Um, it will be uh, stored on uh, Twitch for 60 days. So you can come right back here to my Twitch channel, look at my, look at my VODs and watch it there. And then after that, it will move to my YouTube channel, which is where my entire archive, every video I've ever done, that's all my videos are there. So if you do exclamation point YouTube in chat, that'll give you a link to my YouTube channel. And the nice thing about my YouTube channel is that it is not monetized. So you won't see any ads. Um, you can watch videos straight through on my YouTube channel with no ads at all, uh, which for longer streams like, you know, like mine, uh, I feel like that's helpful for folks where you're not being interrupted every 15 minutes or whatever. Um, so there you go. I do have a YouTube channel. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff on there. So enjoy. Um, 
Esther asks, do I need to have something installed uh, before starting besides Node? No, we're going to, uh, as long as you have a, a MongoDB Atlas cluster, which I think most of us do, right? You, you have a MongoDB Atlas cluster and you have Node installed on your machine uh, and VS Code, uh, then you should be good to go. Yeah, everything else is packages that we're going to install as we work through the project. Good questions. Anybody have any other questions before we get started? You can ask questions at any time. Um, I'm, you know, I will. I do try to pause occasionally and see if folks have questions, but feel free to ask on the fly as we're cooking. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions, but again, feel free to ask if you have them. So uh, let's take a quick peek here and see. Uh, I just want to create a quick take a, a quick look at the repositories here and show you. We have two different repositories here. One of them is for the back end, and that's what we're going to be building first. So essentially, all we're going to be building is just our server.js. And once again, this is what's going to be uh, allowing us to talk to the database. And we're going to run that on one, um, uh, one port in localhost. So that's going to be running in the background. It's going to be processing requests from our front end, and it's going to be talking to the database. And then we're going to be having our React front end running on a different local host. And it's going to be talking to our API, to our back end, which is going to be talking to the database, talks to the server, talks to the front end. So you kind of see how those all link together. All right. So this is what we're going to be building first. You can see it's very small. There's not going to be a lot here. Um, and that's on purpose because that's not really the point of today. The point of today is the React front end. Okay, uh, there we go. So if we're thinking about our server, um, our server is where, like I said, um, our, our all of the talking to the database is going to happen, right? We're storing our posts in the database. That's where all the back and forth to the database is going to happen. So looking at the functionality that we have here just displayed on the homepage, um, what do we think are some of the uh, some of the conversations that we're going to have to have with the database uh, in order to get the information? You can be general. Just what what kind of operations, what kind of CRUD operations are we going to have to do um, in order to make this app functional? What do y'all think? I'm not just going to be talking at you. I'm, I'm asking questions too. What are some of the CRUD operations that we're going to have to make sure our server can handle? Yeah, we're going to have to get, right? We're going to have to get all of the posts, all of the existing posts, right? And then as CLF said, we're going to have to get an individual post, right? If I click read more, I want to pull up a single post. Exactly. Yes, those are great. Get, um, yes, and create a blog post, right? We have the, opp we have the ability to create a new post. Exactly. <laughs> We go get indeed. Yes, and as Copper Lily also said, we need the ability to delete or delete hey, um, a, uh, a a blog post. Yes, so those are some of the operations we're going to have to set up in our server to tell the database to do. All right. So I've got an, uh, an empty, um, just an empty VS Code window pulled up here. Oh, thank you for the follow, let's go. Ladle 001 just followed. Let's go indeed. I'm going to get my terminal open. I'm going to use git bash. Let's go. Thank you for the prime sub. My goodness. <laughs> Ladle 001 just subscribed with prime. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Bezos is not going to be afford be able to afford his next hat. I can tell you that already. <laughs> Good job, y'all. All right. So first off, we're going to go ahead and uh, initialize npm. And the quick way to do that is just just do npm init dash y. And what that does is it skips all of the prompts um, that it tries to all the questions it tries to ask you. You just skip it with that. So npm init dash y. Or you can do npm init and just hit enter a bunch of times. Either way is fine. And since this is our backend only, we're really only going to be installing the packages that we need to power the backend. Um, so for those, we're really just going to, what, what, what do you all think? What are some of the things we're going to need 
in just our server, forgetting about the, the front end and React and all that, what are some of the things that you think we might need in just the server, in just the back end? What's some useful packages? Express, absolutely, yep. Mongoose, absolutely. Uh, cores, yes, correct. And we've almost got it. If I'm using um, something like Mongoose, if I'm talking to my database, uh, the database has to know who I am, right? There has to be some kind of um, authentication that occurs. Uh, so what's a, also a good idea to have in your server if you're doing any kind of authentication secrets? Passport is good for user authentication, yes, but in general, let's let's think in general. If I am if I want if I have any secrets that I don't necessarily want to push up to GitHub, what do I need? Secrets. Yeah, Renee. Dot env exactly. Dot env. Um, really, that's just to hide things like um, my database password, right? Um, but you can use it for other things as well. API keys. Um, anything that you uh, want to store separately and then use in your main code as a variable. So generally passwords or API keys, things like that. All right, so I'm going to install Express, Mongoose, Cores, and .env. Do, 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 do. Yep. All right. And first thing I'm going to do before I forget <laughs> because I have forgotten this recently, uh, is I'm going to make my git ignore and my .env files. And the first thing I'm going to go ahead and put into git ignore, thank you for the follow, Stan Ree. Stan underscore we just followed. Uh, the first thing I'm going to put in my git ignore uh, are two things, node modules and dot env. So what that's going to do is as soon as I save this, it's going to make sure that node modules doesn't get pushed to GitHub because it's huge and there's no need to push that. Um, and dot env so I can store my secrets and they don't get pushed. And in my dot env uh, file, this is where I'm going to store my database credentials. So let's go ahead and just get that in there. Let me go to my see. So I've got the fit my finished version over here, and I'm going to copy my credentials. And I'm going to show it to you. Um, Wade says, does dot env hide variables from front end? Um, so it basically what it does is it is it allows you to um, use those variables wherever you need them, but I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I understand the question. Um, so are you asking if you could use your, like access one of these .env variables um, within your front end React client by just referencing it? Because it, I mean, you you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to because it's looking within the existing like structure of the of the project and inside of our structure we're only going to be having our server and our dot env and get ignore really that's the the front end is going to be its own separate project so if you want to pass anything from the back end to the front end um, you would need to do that you know via the appropriate uh, routing and and request response. Yeah, it, really, the main reason for this is that it hides it from GitHub. So how I'm doing it, and I'm just I'm I'm pasting my connection string in here. Um, I trust you guys. Please don't get up to any shenanigans. I just want to show you guys how this works, and I will be changing my password um, immediately after the stream. So there you go. Um, so really, all you do is you declare your variable. I've called mine Mongo URI. That's just kind of standard, but you could call it database URI or whatever makes sense to you. Generally, all caps. Uh, you've got your username, your password, and then 
in your connection string, after the slash and before the question mark, after the slash and before the question mark, this is where you add the custom name for your what? What element of MongoDB is this? Here inside of the connection string, you specify the name for your Yes, you specify the name for your, um, wait, database. Yeah, it's not the collection, it's the, it's the database, yep. <laughs> yeah, so inside, if we look inside of MongoDB here, We can see that we specify a uh, custom name because that's how it'll show up inside of our list right here. So um, if you didn't specify a custom name, <laughs> it will come out looking like test. Um, so you don't have to. If you just leave that blank in between, um, you'll see it just it's just labeled as test. Now that's okay technically, but if you have a bunch of apps in your project, you're gonna want to make sure that you specify the appropriate name. Um, and that you can, uh, you know, know what you're, know where you're looking, and know which uh, one to click into for which app. So that's why that's helpful. So I've named mine React Log. You can name yours whatever you like. It's up to you. So I'm saving this, and the next thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to create my server.js file. So inside of server.js, this is going to be the brain of our backend. Um, and normally what we would do is we would also build out a more complex structure. What do we call that structure? Um, when we build out a, like we have a, we have a sort of a general file structure and it contains the um, various elements of our backend kind of broken out according to their function. Yeah, we call that MVC. Uh, and generally that's, that stands for model view controller. Um, but in our case, our backend is going to be so simple that we're just going to go ahead and keep everything inside of server.js for now. It would be overkill, in my opinion, to go ahead and build out that entire structure when really everything is going to fit into a fairly small server.js file. And part of the reason for that is because React is going to be handling some logic uh, for us and some of that some of that brain power is going to be offloaded into react on it's going to happen on the client side so a lot of what you're going to see here in the server is really just that conversation with the database handling what's thrown at it from our client all right so the first thing i'm going to do is this is all pretty standard you should recognize this stuff we're going to set up express and we're going to do our require statements express require express and I'm also going, since we're putting everything in one file here, I'm going to also just go ahead and require mongoose. We're not going to have like a separate config, you know, we're not going to have like a separate config file. Um, I'm also going to set up cores. Now cores is for uh, cross origin requests, uh, which happens when, you know, you're, um, if you if you don't have cores and you're trying to do uh, requests that are um, crossing from like one uh, client to another, uh, Chrome in or Chrome in most browsers, in the case of uh, you know in the interest of security, will sometimes block it and say that cross origin requests are not allowed. And so by using cores, you can tell Chrome, hey, it's okay, dude. This is what I mean to do. You're going to see some cross origin requests. Um, please let them through. Let me access my API. And then the last thing I need to do is go ahead and require .env. .env. .config. Um, big, I can't spell. There we go. .env. .config. Um, and this makes sure that we can access our .env variables inside of this file. Well, actually, inside of our backend. So. If you are using .env and you want to use uh, variables that are stored in here, 
multiple times across multiple files, all you need to do is just make sure that you have this statement inside of your server.js and then everything else will, um, <laughs> everything else uh, should be able to read those .env variables. Hey, uh, Oplius, how's it going? Hope you're having a good day. So you should recognize all this stuff if you've ever built an MVC app before or anything like that or a CRUD app before. All of it's pretty standard, right? Pretty boilerplate. So we set up app as express, and then we set up our middleware. We only have two pieces of middleware here. What is middleware? When I say middleware, what is that? What does middleware do for us? So I'm going to set these two things up while you all think about that. What does middleware help us do? It helps us communicate. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And so, so it is, it does help with communication, right? It's kind of a middleman when messages are passing back and forth between front end and back end. Um, middleware can do a variety of things. It essentially intercepts those messages and it's kind of like, um, you know, in those like big United Nations meetings, right? You've got people who are speaking in all sorts of different languages. And then you've got a whole booth full of translators up in a room somewhere. And what they're doing is then they translate what somebody's saying into the language of whoever is listening. So might be translating, you know, English into Mandarin or um, Japanese into German. I don't know. Um, but middleware is kind of like that. It helps us translate these messages to make sure that the recipient can use and understand them. So in this case, we've got our cores, which is making sure that those, uh, that those messages are authorized back and forth. And then we've got, um, our JSON parser here. So making sure that we can, um, uh, use, uh, uh parse JSON messages that are going back and forth. Hey, Anna, how's it going? Good to see you. And there's a variety of middleware out there. Uh, you'll see things like Passport. Um, you can even build your own middleware. Uh, there's things, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember what was, I mentioned a piece of middleware last time that um, you can actually build. I'm spacing on it now, but you things like um, Molter, which is for handling images. If, if a message contains an image, you wanna make sure the recipient can read that image, that kind of thing. Um, pagination, sure, yeah. There's all sorts of middleware out there. This is just a couple of small pieces. These are pretty common though. All right, now let's set up our Mongoose connection, or sorry, MongoDB connection. And in order to do that, we're using Mongoose. So I'm thinking most of you are probably pretty familiar with Mongoose at this point. Um, is there anybody that wants to, that, that doesn't know what Mongoose is? Feel free to say so. All I'm doing here is setting up my connection and passing in my uh, connection string, which is saved in my .env file. So notice how I have to reference this, right? If I want to reference anything that's inside my .env file, I have to say process.env dot and then the variable name. If you forget to do that, like I do all the time, you'll wonder why it's not working. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is an environment variable. Red Carpet says, I don't know, but I don't want to stall the lesson. That is perfectly okay. You're not going to stall the lesson. That's why I ask for, uh, ask for questions and, and hope people, you know, if, if you don't understand something, feel free to ask because you're not the only one, I'm sure. Welcome to the stream, by the way. So yeah, Mongoose is kind of like a helper. Um, what it does is it helps you communicate uh, in a more natural way with MongoDB. Uh, so MongoDB is great, right? It can do a lot of things, but I don't know if you've ever tried to build an app with just MongoDB um, itself, but like using the, the built-in, you know, uh, functions and things that you can do to talk to MongoDB. Uh, it's not easy. It's kind of hard. There's a lot you have to do. Uh, there's a lot you have to remember. And what Mongoose, what Mongoose helps you do is really simplify that and make it more like plain English, more logical statements, um, simple methods like find, find one, find one and update, delete one and update. Uh, and then probably the most important thing it can help you do, which we're going to do here in a minute, is it can help add structure to your MongoDB database. 
So if you're familiar with MongoDB, you know that it's uh, what's known as a NoSQL database. And so all of the entries, all of the entries in your collections are stored individually. They are independent of each other. They exist in the same collection, but they're independent of each other. Um, and so this is great when you have sort of unstructured data, but if your app is relying on your data to have a certain structure, then you kind of got to help it a little bit. You got to, you got to add some structure to your data, make sure that, that all the required fields are being put in the database and retrieved from the database so that your app knows what to expect and it can function properly. So what Mongoose helps us do is add what are called schemas. Um, which are basically blueprints for the data that's going into the database. And all the data going into the database has to match that blueprint. Otherwise, it's not allowed to go in. Tall Dark Encoding says, is using Mongoose like how we use Express for request and error handling rather than building everything in Node without Express? Red Carpet official just followed. Oh, thank you for the follow, Red Carpet. Um, yeah, it's kind of similar, right? It's just another layer of um, abstraction. So when we say abstraction, it's really just adding layers on top of the, the, the base operations that are occurring to make it easier for us puny, squishy humans to understand what's going on and be more efficient in what we build. Um, and so it makes it less clear what's actually happening underneath, but it makes it easier for us humans to um, talk to the tools that we're using. So yeah, it's kind of just like another layer of um, abstraction on top of uh, what's actually happening. Kind of like programming languages are uh, an abstraction on top of assembly, right? We're not typing our ones and zeros. Paypro just followed. Thank you for the follow, Paypro. So connecting with Mongoose is very easy to do. Uh, all you have to, all, technically all you have to do is this, but we want to make sure that we get alerted when we're connected, because otherwise, how are you going to know it's it's working? Um, Esther says, I understand, but I don't I don't remember my collection password. I really hope I left it as test. So you can reset your password uh, if you need to. Um, I do it all the time. So no worries. Feel, you can reset it if you need to. So after we're connected, I'm gonna just going to uh, resolve a promise here and say, hey, after the connection occurs, we, we normally use async await when we do this, but um, it's also important to remember that you can do it with regular promises as well. Connected to DB. So we're going to console log that after the connection occurs. And if it doesn't work, oops, we're going to catch that error. And we're just going to console log whatever comes back. Console log error, oops, error dot message. Okay, so what that'll do is if, if we're connected, it'll tell us. If we're not, it'll give us an error message. Um, and also to in my ENV, I'm just gonna change this so that I'm not writing to the same uh, database. So that's pretty easy to do. Now let's set up our schema. Our schema is like the blueprint. Once again, the schema is like the blueprint for the data that's going into our database, right? Modular paper 421 just followed. Thank you for the follow modular. Um, so it contains, it should contain all of the fields that we want to make sure our data has. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the finished product one more time. And see if you can tell me what do you what do you think some of the fields are that we're gonna want to have. Um, so let's go we'll go into just one of the. I'm gonna go into this post here. So just by looking at this, what do you all think are the fields we're gonna need to store in the database so we can retrieve them and display them like so? What are some of the things that we're gonna want to have? Elements. What are the elements of a blog post? Title, yeah. Uh, oh, hey, Dylan, welcome to the stream. Image, title, author, content. Wow, Dylan, you nailed it. That's all four of them. Great job. 
Yes, exactly. Dylan, uh, Dylan nailed it. Those are all, those are the four elements that we're going to have. Now, could you have more? Absolutely. I don't know that you could have less. I think these are, that's probably the minimum for a, for a viable blog post. Um, but let's, let's go with this. You can always come back and you can modify these things later to be bigger and better. That's kind of the goal. So I'm going to set up a schema once again, just a blueprint. And the way I declare that is just telling Mongoose, Hey, this is a new schema. And then I tell Mongoose what the structure for that blueprint is supposed to be. So title and the type. So sort of like with, if you're familiar with TypeScript at all or other type languages, you have to specify what, um, what type of data this is that you're putting in this field. Uh, or if you're familiar with something like SQL or relational databases, this is exactly what you have to do. You have to tell it what type of data you are putting in this field. Um, and there's, you can do other things. You can make them required. Um, there's all sorts of settings that you can do in schemas. We're going to keep it simple today. We're just going to say, hey, these are all strings. But you can have them be numbers. You can have them be uh, enums, all sorts of things. You can even have references to other um, documents within the database. We did that with the uh, we did that with the uh, cat book when we uh, a couple weeks ago when we built that we did um, authentication we added authentication to the cat book. Uh, when we did that, we had to create references. If if a user posted a, uh, an entry, we had that entry in one collection, and then we had to reference the user who posted it reference to their account in another collection. And so we were able to do that as well. So this is our schema. And then what we do is we wrap that schema in what we call a model. So the model uses that blueprint and stores it in a specific collection. Because if you recall, inside of our uh, con connection string here, we specified which um, which database it's going in, but we didn't specify which collection. So here we say, take, hey, Mongoose, make a new model, reference the blueprint that we just created. We're calling this model just post and reference, reference the blueprint we just created. So now this is telling Mongoose inside of our react blog here go ahead and just save it in the posts collection so that's what we just told mongoose to do you could have multiple collections inside of one database um, that's a pretty standard thing especially when we're talking about something like adding authentication let's see where's a good one here cat book so here inside of the cat book we have cats, which is the actual posts, and we have users. Those are two separate collections. And so the schema is really important because it tells Mongoose where to save this data that you're giving it. All right. Oh, Sushi Samurai, thank you for the sub. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I'm sorry I didn't see it. Thank you, Sushi. That's an awesome name, by the way. Sushi Samurai. That's rad. And you're a dev. Man, person of many talents, I'm sure. <laughs> Mavi says you should probably add keywords for SEO. Just kidding. <laughs> oh, man, that's a whole nother beast. I don't want Google to be able to find my stuff. So now we've created our schema. Mongoose knows where we're going to be saving stuff in the database. And so we can now we can make the elements that talk to the database and tell the database what to do with this data. So we know where it's going. And now we need the logic to say, all right, what happens at any given point? Uh, so we talked a little bit earlier about some of the controllers that we might need. Um, and so I believe what we said was we wanted to say, get all posts, um, get one post, post, um, create new post, and delete post. Okay. So I think we're going to have four controllers here and controllers is just the name that we give to functions on the back end that are sort of providing some logic and 
and uh, uh, brain power to our app. Now, one thing you might be wondering is, do I also need controllers for rendering the pages? So if you have built full stack apps before, just using regular JavaScript and Express, um, you generally usually also need a controller that's going to take a route such as like the, the slash and just all it does is just render the homepage, right? Just res.render homepage, display the homepage when somebody goes home. Um, or, you know, send, you know, handle links to go to the new post page or whatever. We don't need that in this case because we're using React. And React has something called React Router, uh, which can internally on the client side can handle all those routes, um, or handle all those links um, and take you in the proper direction, right? Take you to the right page, render those pages. React is already very good at rendering things. Um, and so we don't need those specific controllers for this app. Uh, K Dash, welcome to the stream. They say, hi, are you still working on the Facebook for cats? Uh, no, today we're building a blog template in React. Uh, however, if you missed the last um, Facebook for cats video or the last two, um, you can find those right here on my Twitch channel. The VODs are still available. They'll be here for 60 days um, and I'll be moving them to YouTube. So exclamation point YouTube, if you also want to take a look at my YouTube channel. Um, but no, we had two streams on the Facebook for cats, and so we're on a new project now. But feel free to check out the VODs. Okay, Tall Black Encoding says, does React Router uh, replace the Express Router? Now, as far as, so you'll notice that, you know, we didn't, uh, we didn't set up Express Router here, right? We didn't have to. Um, because that traffic is basically just going to be funneled directly to the exact place it needs to go. Um, so yeah, in our case, I think it's going to replace the express router. Um, and we'll see that when we get to the, when we get into the client side work. <laughs> no worries, Sushi. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, that's a cute little dancing dinosaur. <laughs> So let's set up our controllers. First one, let's go ahead and just do the get all posts. So this is just gonna be app.get. And what this is doing is it's just saying, hey, if a get request comes in and it has a certain um, path attached to it, then do something. And so in our case, we're gonna have app.get, we're gonna have a path, co path called just posts. And this is gonna be sent up from our client and so we're going to be listening for app.get slash posts. And when we get that, when something, uh, when this gets, um, when this fires, it's going to cause the execution of a function. So we're going to have an async function here. And this is where we're going to be talking to the database. So why is this why did i make this async why didn't I, why didn't i just do a regular function here what would be the reason for that oops why did i make this async Esther says it could fail. Yeah, and, and Phelan too. Welcome to the stream, Phelan. Absolutely, coming in hot with the with the correct answer there, both of you. Um, exactly. So there's a there's a variety of reasons, right? What async allows us to do is to better handle these types of um, requests where it could take a long time, right? We need to wait on that response. We that response has to come back first before the rest of this can execute. So. It's going to be an asynchronous function and we need to wait. We need to await that response from the database before we do anything else. Also, it could fail as well, right? Yeah. So we're going to just go ahead and await this. Post.find. And so it's going to wait on Mongoose to go to the database, say, hey, Mongo hey, hey MongoDB, get me all the posts. Just 
all of them. Give them, give them to me. So we get them back. And then once, only once we have them, do we proceed. We send a response and we just send all of them. These are gonna be wrapped up inside of a nice big object in a big old bundle. And we're just gonna toss them at the client side and say, hey, client side, do whatever you want with this. My work here is done, <laughs> right? So that's all this needs to do. And similarly, we're gonna have another one to just get one post. So I'm gonna, this is gonna be similar. So I'm gonna copy and paste. Um, however, in this case, we're just going to get a single post from the database. Um, so if I want to go into the database and retrieve a specific post, a specific post, what's the best way inside of my collection, what's the best way to identify one specific post? How would we do that? If I'm looking in MongoDB, if I'm looking in MongoDB, how do I, how do I identify? I might have a hundred posts in here. How do I identify one? Yeah, exactly. Each of these is going to have a unique ID, right? going to have a unique ID, which is assigned by MongoDB and is truly unique. So I could have two posts with the title of test two, right? And that wouldn't matter because it would find the one with the correct unique ID. And so what that means is that's what I'm going to be, that's what I need to pass in from the front end. I need to pass a specific ID from the front end to my server. So my server can toss it over to the database and be like, get this post for me. Um, and the way that we can do that, the way that we can have essentially a variable, a, a variable um, field inside of a path like this is by using this colon. What this colon does is it says, hey, this, this value here, it's not going to truly be the word ID. It's going to be a representative value that's stored in this, um, this, this ID variable, essentially. Uh, and so what this is, what this is, is what's called a parameter or a param. And so we can access this param inside of our um, method where we where we're telling MongoDB what to do. So let's see how that looks. Um, and Yarmo suggested that maybe we could use the find one method. We absolutely could. Um, however, there's an even more specific method that we can use. And the nice thing about Mongoose is that it's very literal. So it's very plain English. Um, so if I want to find a find one item by ID in MongoDB, what, what Mongoose method do you think I would use? Once again, don't think too hard about it. What's a good mongoose method for that? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, we can just use we can just use find by ID. Find by. Let's see, await post. Find by uh, ID. Yeah. One thing I want to do want to check here. Sorry, I'm just checking something real quick. Oh, save that. I'm noticing it's not turning my. Um, I'm. Ex I would expect all these mongoose statements to turn green. So I'm wondering if we might get an error here when we try to run it. But we'll see in a minute. I did install mo mongoose. I think. Make sure. Yeah, I did. Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll figure it out. Fuel says, I never think too hard. Oh, did I spell something wrong? Oh, I did, yes. I was talking while I was typing, and so that's why it didn't work. There we go, good catch. So VS Code has some very helpful color coding, which can alert you when things are not correct. So great catch, Mortimer, you figured it out. Um, but yes, all these mongoose um, methods and statements are gonna turn green when uh, VS Code is able to access them. So Mongo schema is now green. All of these references to our post collection are also green. And so we're gonna use find by ID to find a specific post. So I think if I, let me try this again here, post find. Yeah, so now um, 
now that Mongoose is working properly, you can see it's giving me a list of methods here. So if you're not sure what method to use, you can always just start typing something that you think makes sense and then just use that one. So find by ID, I think that makes sense. Now I wanna access this param, which we are passing in in our path here. So if I wanna access this param variable that we're passing in, um, all I need to do is say rec, ugh, rec, cannot spell, my goodness, rec params dot ID. So all we're doing here, it's kind of like process dot env in the variable name. We're just saying, hey, look inside the request, look inside the request params and grab the one called ID because you could have more than one. Potentially, you could have more than one param inside this inside this request. So we're just telling it which one to which one to access, and then what it's going to do is it's going to retrieve the post, and it's going to wrap it up in a lovely object, and it's going to send it over to the client side. Uh, and then next, we want to so I'm going to delineate these a little better so we know what we're doing here get one post so next we'll create a new post all right so instead of git i'm going to have my server listen for a post request now if, these are essentially just methods and there's four methods um, that are used for sending messages back and forth. Um, so post doesn't refer to like the blog post. It refers to a specific type of method. And so um, does anybody know what the, can anybody list off some other methods aside from post? So we have post and get, but does anybody remember any other ones? Any of these standard, um, th these, these kind of standard express methods? Could, yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. <laughs> ask us flip post get patch delete yeah great exactly yep put post get patch delete um those are all the different types of messages that are, are methods that you can use hey coach uh so what we're doing today is we're building a blog with react and first we're setting up our back-end api and then we're going to build our client side react app to hit the api that we're currently setting up Gil says we do all as patch basically and get, <laughs> and that's the thing is that these 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 method names aren't necessarily set in stone. You just need to have a relationship between your client and your server where they're both in agreement that they're listening for the same method or that they're that they're that they're working with the same method in the same path path so that they can talk to each other. So you you've seen me use you know get methods for deletes before, right? Um, things that don't necessarily line up as far as the method name, but it still works if you have, you know, the correct method and the correct path talking to, to each other on the client side and the server side. But in our case, we can use the correct one here. We can see we're going to listen to a post request and the path is going to contain posts. Um, and then as same as before, it's going to be async because we're talking to the database. And we're going to be creating a new post. So I'm going to say const new post, new post. And in order to create a new post, first thing I need to do is I need to pass the data that I'm getting from the front end. I need to pass it through our blueprint. I need to pass it through our model, through our blueprint, and make sure that everything is lined up and I need to essentially build the, um, the structure of what I'm actually going to be saving in the database. I need to give it that structure um, so that what I'm saving in the database lines up with what my, my app is expecting to, ret to retrieve. So first thing I do is I just say, hey, I want to build a new post, which means the, the object that we're going to be saving. I want to build it based on the body of the request that has been passed in. So we're getting a big old lump of data from the front end, and it may or may not be structured the way we want. First thing we do is we pass it through that blueprint. 
get everything lined up and we're gonna store it in this new post variable here. Now I can go ahead and save it into the database. So now I do my await and it's very simple to do this. We just say new post dot save. And that is what's actually going to write it and save it to our um, database. And then I'm going to send that data back to the front end. So basically all we're doing here is we're taking in the data, we're running it through the blueprint, saving it to the database, and then sending the result back to the front end um, so that React can know that, yep, we're good. I've got the new save post. It can, it can hold it in state on the front end. <laughs> Asuka says, I use patch only if it's partial updates. Yeah, I think that's really what patch is for, right? Um, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, like in the, in the, in the general standard. And Phil says some APIs always return 200 and then you need to expect the payload to find out if it failed. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you need to actually take a look. It doesn't return the right error code. Ah, nice. Okay. All right. Last controller we're going to do here is our delete. So for delete post, I'm going to go ahead and just copy our first one here so I don't have to type everything out again. Um, and this one, we are going to go ahead and use the delete method because that's what makes sense in this, in this case. And as we did before in our git, I'm going to want to make darn sure that I'm deleting the right post, right? I don't want to just go in and maybe delete the first post on the list. I want to delete the exact post that the user clicked on. So in this case, once again, I need to pass in a parameter and actually I'm going to just copy the rest of this here. Here we go. Um, I don't need, in this case, I don't need to send back the post information, but I do still need to await whatever is going to happen. So I need to wait for the operation to be finished before I send any kind of response. And Asuka says, fun fact, there's no agreed rule where delete should have a JSON payload or not. Ah, interesting. Feels like there's not a lot of agreed on rules uh, in JavaScript in general, but maybe I'm just being facetious. I'm a SQL developer. There's tons of rules. All right. So if I want to find an item or find a document by its ID and delete it, what mongoose method do you think I should use? Once again, don't think too hard. Think first thing that comes to your head. Go. I want to find an item by ID and delete it. What do you think we should use? Yes. <laughs> exactly. See that like an engineer. Yes. Find by ID and delete. Yes. And Esther said delete one. That's also an option. But in this case, we do have the ID. So we're going to use um, find by ID and delete there we go and we're just once again we're going to pass in that param from the path and what we're going to send back is just a custom status that tells um, our front end what happened now i'll admit i don't know for sure if this is the correct status to send but i am going to send a custom message to say post deleted. So hopefully that's good enough. <laughs> and as you, you know, play around more with Mongoose, you'll find that there are a ton of methods out there that you can use. Um, if you ever look at the drop down, there's so many, there's so many methods. And so it's really just finding whichever one works for your specific use case. Uh, the documentation is pretty good, which can help you understand the pros and cons of each of those methods. Um, but there's one, there's a mongoose method for pretty much whatever the heck you want to do uh, when you're working with MongoDB, which is pretty cool. All right, so we've got all of our controllers in place. Now, if I want this server to actually run and start listening for things, what, what's the next thing I need to do or the last thing I need to do? 
So I want to actually spin up this server and see if it works. What's the last thing I need in every server? Uh, even before NPM start, Esther, even be before that, if I tried to spin up the server right now, I wouldn't be able to access it at all. Yes, Celiac and Mavi, yes, Ozka, exactly. We need our app.listen. Yeah, um, and I'm gonna go ahead and specify a specific server here. I'm gonna say 5500, because I already have something um, running on some of the more common ports. So I'm specifying 5500, yours can be whatever you want. Just make sure it doesn't conflict uh, with anything else that you have running, because then you'll get a very confusing error. Um, so just make sure it's a unique port that you're not already using. So I'm just gonna say um, server started on uh, port 5500. Uh, what we sometimes do is we'll specify this port as like a variable. So I can use a template literal here and just reference the port variable, but I'm being lazy today. So this is what you get. This is a very lightweight, very paired back back end because it's not really the point. The point is going to be more of the front end. All right, I'm going to save this. And I think we have everything here. I'll get rid of these extra lines. So we're, we'll go ahead and test this server and then we'll take a break. Um, Cause this is, this is our backend, this is it. This is all of it. One single file, very small, um, not a lot going on here. As I, as I mentioned, there's, this is a very lightweight backend because it doesn't have to be any more than this. Uh, React is handling pretty much everything else. So yeah, let's save this. And then I'm gonna try and do NPM start. Hey, check it out. So how do I know that this is working? Well, I know it's working because I get my server started method message and I get my connected to database message. And so if you recall in our connection function up here, we basically said, hey, connect first, then if, if successful, console log this message, else console log the error. <laughs> Asuka says, update by ID, do we need that? Yes, you could absolutely, if you wanna make this full CRUD, you can add an update controller as well. Um, our client doesn't actually have update functionality. Um, however, if you wanna see an example of that, you could go to our catbook project from a couple weeks ago. Uh, and we did, we did full CRUD on that one. We did create, read, update, delete. So if you want examples of update controllers, um, you can look at that for how you can use Mongoose to, uh, well, it's essentially, it's just fine by ID and update. So it's pretty straightforward in that way. Mavi says, nah, there's no update today. You make a mistake and yeet it into space. Exactly. You make a mistake, you got to delete it and start over. That's how we're rolling today. All right. So our server is running. This was the boring part. Um, when we come back from the break, we're going to start a completely new project. And we're going to build out our React front end. And what our React front end is going to do is actually talk to this server on port 5500. It's going to be sending requests to our API, which is localhost 5500, and then whatever path. Um, it's going to be able to talk to it, and it's going to be able to access these controllers and do stuff with the database. Uh, Azka says, I have a doubt if we have post and post ID. Um, let's see, I'm gonna make sure I see what you're looking at here. Post and post ID, which has higher priority? Are you talking about um, these, these ones here? Yeah, so essentially it has to do with the nature of the request. Um, because in this case, this is this is this only occurs when um, we essentially when we load the home page. So this will only fire when we load the home page. And then when post ID comes through, it's gonna read this entire path here and send it to the second one. This is only gonna occur when we um, go to that post's individual page. So there's there's gonna be from what I can from what I can tell, there's gonna be no problem, there's gonna be no conflicts here. 
Um, this one is just gonna, gonna trigger when the home page is visited. And this one's just gonna trigger when we click on the individual page for a post. What if there is not get all? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm following that question. Feel free to ask again. I, I'm just not quite getting what, picking up what you're putting down there. What if there is not get all? Uh, Sushi says we don't have to. Um, we don't have to refresh after post or delete. Aha! That's the beauty of React. <laughs> that's the beauty of React is that it will help us do that. So that's the cool thing about React is that you don't have to refresh the entire page. Um, what it's going to do is, for example, after a delete, is it's just going to remove that card. Hey, no worries, Sushi. That's you're going to start to see hopefully some of the cool beauty of React and the cool things it can do, um, because it can help with when, in apps where you have a lot of moving parts, a lot of different components. Um, React is a great asset for for that very reason: is that you don't have to refresh the entire page every time something changes. You can just re, you can just change the thing that changed. Like one card changed. All right, get rid of that one card. Don't touch anything else on the page. Um, so that's the cool part. Hey, Melstar, good to see you. Glad to have you here. I'm glad you are uh, doing well in the catch up crew. Yeah, sushi. It is awesome. Exactly. Yep. All right. So our my server is running. I hope yours is too. Um, once again, if you are just joining us now uh, and you'd like to catch up and participate, uh, do exclamation point project in chat. Uh, that's where you can find the links to the finished repos. And so you can go ahead and spin up your server um, and get up to the exact same point where we are at now. Uh, so you'll want to access the API code repo. So that first one in the Mubot post there, uh, that's where what we just did, that's where all that is. So just go in on in, in there. Um, you'll need to add a .env file um, and put in your connection string for your database in order for it to work. Um, but other than that, you should just be able to do uh, npm install. It'll install all the packages, create your .env file, put in your database string, and then you're off to the races. <laughs> Catch up crew rules. Indeed, they do. They're great. All righty. So, it's break time. Let's go ahead and take a break. Um, we're going to take five minutes, and then when we come back, we're going to start digging in to our React front end client. Uh, and we're going to be starting in. So I would go ahead and uh, create a new project folder um, because leave your server running, leave this instance of VS Code running, create a new project folder for your front end, and then open that up in a new VS Code window. So leave this VS Code window running, leave your server. See, leave your server going on whatever port you set it at. Um, we're not going to touch that anymore, but it needs to stay running so we can access it. And then open up a new VS Code window with a new project folder, and that's where we're going to build our front end. Copper Lily asks, do you have kitties right now? I do. I have five foster kittens right now, and they all need names. So if you are sitting on a big old pile of channel points, um, if you look at those channel points, look at the channel points rewards, uh, you can name a kitten. You can name a foster kitten. And not only can you name them, I will bring them on camera. And so you can see uh, the kitten that you have just named. And it can be whatever name you want, as long as it's appropriate for, you know, safe for like people going into a shelter and adopting a kitten, right? It has to, <laughs> it can't be anything vulgar. So <laughs> other than that, uh, it can be whatever you want. So check out those channel points rewards. If you want to name a kitten, uh, feel free to claim one of those rewards. All right, break time. Five minutes timer, Google. I will see you all back here in five minutes. Please do get up, get a drink, use the restroom, whatever you need to do. Uh, and I will see you back here shortly.
All right, folks, we got about a minute left in the break. So do come on back whenever you're ready. Get yourself some hydration. Use the restroom. If you have sat down this entire break, please do get up and stretch if you are able to do so. Um, roll your wrists, roll your neck. Nobody wants carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so please do get up. Pet your dogs, pet your cats, pet your significant other with their permission, of course. Oh, Deb Philipper, I had a semi-productive weekend. The stream is great timing. It's next on my list is to read the React documentation before Leon's class on React. Ah, uh, yes, that's awesome. So Dev, um, if you might find it helpful, uh, I have an eight part series where we go through the React documentation together. We don't necessarily read it word for word, but we do go through and we do all the examples. Um, we go through all the concepts, we reinforce those concepts. Um, and so you're welcome to, of course, go through the documentation on your own. That's perfectly fine. But if you need a little help, um, I have a whole series on that where we do that exact thing. Alrighty, we are live again. Hi, folks. Uh, Kosh says on Twitch, uh, that'll be on my YouTube channel. So if you do exclamation point YouTube, um, you can find it there all eight parts. They're labeled parts one through eight. Uh, so hopefully it should be pretty easy to find. Um, yeah. And we start at the very beginning. We, we could literally go chapter by chapter through the documentation. Um, the only thing we don't do is the, the advanced topics at the very end. Um, but for a basic understanding of React and how to use it, um, it's I've uh, those documents are fantastic. And I found that going through them live on stream with you all uh, was helpful for me as well. So it was helpful all around. All right, now you may have noticed during that break, you saw me rearranging windows and things. I have my new project folder for my front end. So once again, as a reminder, don't close your server. Keep that open and running. Uh, we're going to need to talk to it later. So I have a new project window here now, a new folder. And that's where I'm going. To, this is where we're going to start building our React front end. Okay. Now, if I want to build a React project quickly and just fire up, you know, fire up a React project in 30 seconds, uh, how do I do that? What's the easiest, quickest and easiest way for me to do that? Veep, yes, Veep is great, absolutely. Um, but even without using Veep, Haha, -ha, yes. Um, so Beat is awesome. I, I actually love Beat. Uh, but we're going to keep it simple today. Uh, and we're just going to use Create React App, which is going to build the, the whole project structure for us. It's going to add some extra stuff. We're going to delete, but that's OK. Um, so I'm going to get my terminal going here. And inside the terminal, all you need to do is type npx. Uh, Esther says, wait, is this a new workspace in VS Code? Yes. So to be clear, um, I have a few extra windows open here because I have my finished versions, but this is the server we just built, okay? It's running in its own VS Code window. So you can see here, this is everything we just built, right? Now I'm going to minimize that, and I have a new window and a new project folder here, okay? I called mine React, uh, React Blog Backend and React Blog front end, but you can call them whatever you want. Um, but we're, we're creating, what we're doing here is the principle of the, the client side app and the API, right? They're two separate, um, they're two separate projects that talk to each other. So that's what we're doing here. We're building two separate projects, our API and our front end client side. And those two are going to talk to each other. So we, we built the API, the, the back end server database, all that stuff that's done. Now, we're building our client side app. And you can have, if you're not familiar, you can have multiple VS Code windows open independent of each other. So that's what we've done here. Um, so we're going to use uh, Create React App to build our React app quickly. Um, and you're going to type npx, so not npm, but npx um, create react 
app, and then you're going to give your project a name. So uh, independently of your project folder, uh, I'm just going to call mine um, blog app two because I already have a blog app one. Um, so that's what I'm going to call mine. And then we'll once you hit enter, you'll see it's going to start automatically building all the folders and installing a bunch of dependencies. And we just got to let that cook for a second. So you can see it's running and it's going to install a bunch of things. Uh, Dev says, does NPX need to be installed separately like Node or is it part of the same package? It's part of the same thing. It's a part of Node. Uh, I believe the X stands for execute. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but instead of like um, NPM for, I don't know, install, install, I don't know. Uh, X is like execute, like do the thing. But maybe that's just the way I'm remembering it. Maybe that's not real. Maybe that's a false association, but that's how I remember it. NPX, execute, do this stuff, build the thing. All right. There we go. Now we can see that it has built stuff for us. Uh, Esther says NPM error, you know what? This is related to NPM not being able to find a file. Did you do NPX, NPX instead of NPM? And here, I'll put it, if anybody's having trouble, I'll paste the exact statement into, um, into, oh, package manager. Okay, so yeah, so NPM for package manager, NPX for, I, I think of the X as execute, but like I said, could be wrong. Um, X can give it to you. And then, uh, so that's the statement. Um, that's the statement that you type in, NPX, um, create React app, and then app name. Okay, and so you and you did that in a new window, Esther. Uh, no user says, "Why not use Beat?" Yes, absolutely. We have used Beat uh, on stream several times. Uh, I like to do it both ways. I kind of go back and forth, um, just because I think it's important to know how to use both. So, <laughs> Dev says, "Yep, execute is bang on." Yeah, so the X is for execute. Yeah, uh, but yes, we have used Beat on stream here. Uh, I like it a lot. It's great. Um, but today we're not going to. I like to try and experiment with a variety of tools, but NVIT is the best, I think. I, it's, it's lovely. Um, so uh, Esther, what I would suggest is uh, just see if you can Google that error um, and, you know, say like, you know, create React app uh, and then paste the error um, and see if you uh, can determine what that, what the root cause might be there. Is anybody else getting that error? Everybody else uh, able to uh, do their create React app? So create React app is nice because it creates a lot of, you know, files and folders and things for us. Um, and so we can test and make sure that this is working fairly easily. First thing, the most important thing you're going to need to do is follow the instructions that they tell you to do. So we suggest that you begin by typing CD blog app two and NPM start. If you forget to do this, you're not going to be able to fire up your app. So um, CD blog app two. And I should have asked um, Esther, did you get that error when you, after you typed um, uh, create react app or when you typed Oh, you don't have to do NPM init, Esther. In this case, you don't. You can just do NPX create React app and then your app name, and then it should build everything for you. That's all you need to do. So see what I did here? This is my, my brand new terminal, right? And this is the first thing I type. So just do that. And you might have to create a new folder if you started if it started generating files or whatever, and, and um, 
But yeah, that's all you need to do. So we CD into our actual project here. So out of the project folder into our actual project right here. And then we can do NPM start and see if it's working. And it says something's already running on port 3000. Yes, I want to run on a different port. That's just my problem because I've got stuff running in the background. All right, there we go. So this tells us that it's actually working. Um, this is just the boilerplate default stuff. We're going to get rid of all of this, um, but this just tells you it's actually working. All right, so let's go ahead and do a little bit of cleanup to get this ready for us to build on top of it. Get this out of the way here. So inside of my public folder here, I'm going to get rid of everything except index.html. Just delete all this nonsense. Goodbye. OK? So any, the only thing left in my public folder is index.html. And then inside of index.html, um, I'm going to I'm going to just go, I can basically, I'm basically just going to get rid of all the extra stuff. And I'm going to get rid of this comment here in the body. So all I've got left here is essentially just the no script statement here and then the root div. So you do still need this. This is the anchor for where React is going to basically generate everything else. So it's just going to hook into this root and it's going to insert um, all of its, all the HTML it generates is going to live here. And this is what the browser is actually going to render out. So save that. And then inside of the source folder, I know I'm going a little fast here. So um, but you can look at the um, you can look at the at the finished repo and see what's there and what isn't uh, and, and and model off of that. But feel free to ask me to pause for a second if if I'm going too quickly. Um, so I think here down in source, we're gonna get rid of um, we'll get rid of the CSS file. We aren't gonna need that. We're going to keep app.js. We're going to get rid of app.app.test. Uh, get rid of index.css. We're going to keep index.js. Get rid of logo and setup tests and report web vitals. Okay. And then I'm also going to stop. I'm just also just going to kill the, the, the React app that was running because it's going to error out for a while. Um, so this should be all that we need to get started. Engineer Moore says, I need a lot more practice with backend. No, that's fine, yeah. Backend is a little bit of a different beast than, uh, than front end, right? There's, there's some different stuff going on under the hood, exactly. Mintel says, bye bye Yeah, <laughs> it does, it, React, great React app is great, but it does generate a lot of extra stuff that you just don't need. Uh, Esther says, I started a new workspace and I didn't get any problem. Now it's working. I probably messed something the first time. Hey, that's awesome. Great troubleshooting, Esther. Good job. Woo. <laughs> Gabriella said, yeet. Yes, we, we yeet all the extra stuff uh, and only leave what we actually need. Okay, so now inside of my source folder, so I'm inside of the source folder right here, I'm going to create two subfolders in here to help us organize the stuff we're going to be working with. So new folder is going to be components. And another new folder inside of source is going to be pages. And this just gives our app a little bit of structure. This is where we're going to actually put the pages that we're going to be um, displaying. And this is where we're going to be putting um, uh, extra components that are going to go on those pages. Um, so we've got app.js, index.js. OK. Let's take a look at, um, actually, no, let's go ahead and install some stuff. We're going to need some additional packages 
that um, create react app didn't install for us. So we're going to need some more stuff and we'll go ahead and install those things. Now you don't need to do npm init here. We can see that we already have a package.json file, uh, create react app built that for us. So we don't need to do an npm init. It's already been done. Now we can just install packages like we normally would. Hey, Sushi, no worries. Thanks for coming by. Yeah, definitely watch the VOD. That's what they're there for. A lot of folks do that. Um, folks on different time zones will always you know, pop in and catch the VODs later. So good having you here. Um, there's a few things you can tell that it's already installed for us, right? Under dependencies, we've got React, React DOM, React Scripts, Web Vitals. Uh, we're going to install a couple of additional things. So um, I'm going to do npm install. Uh, we're going to use Axios today. We don't normally use Axios, but it's fun to use different things sometimes. We're going to use Bootstrap for styling. That's why I got rid of the CSS files, because we're, be, we're going to be using Bootstrap. Um, we're going to also be using React. Bootstrap, which is a special version of Bootstrap that plays nice with React and can do specific things with React. Uh, React Bootstrap, let's see, we've got React DOM. Uh, we're also going to have React Router Bootstrap. Uh, and what that's going to do is when we're setting up routers, it's going to help us with links and that kind of thing. Um, and then also React Router dom which we talked earlier about routing and how we don't necessarily need to how we don't have like express router on the back end uh, that's because react can handle routing itself so we're going to use the react router to help us do routing uh, and then we got react okay so i think these are all the things we're going to need um, i'm going to install these and then i'll paste the entire uh, install statement in chat and so you can copy that if you need to uh, first off, I'm just going to make sure that everything installs okay for me uh, because I'm prone to misspelling things. So let's see if this works. Wow, I'm amazed I actually spelled everything. The oh, did I? Oh no, it's okay. We're good. Uh, I'm amazed I actually spelled everything right the first time. Everybody, golf clap. I never do that. All right, so here's the install statement. There you go. Uh, Esther says, wait, we deleted the CSS files? We did. You don't necessarily have to. Um, you could leave them, but we're going to be using Bootstrap. Yeah, we're using we're using Bootstrap instead, uh, and that's going to take over the styling for us, so we don't need to make any CSS. <laughs> Engineers, thank you for the collapse. <laughs> Mattel says, I'm... I'm I'm problems to be misspelled. It's okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I misspell things all the time. So I think we have everything we need now. I'm just going to compare it against the finished version and make sure I didn't forget any packages. It happens. All right. Bootstrap, React, React Bootstrap, React DOM, React Router, React Router DOM, React Strings. Okay. Awesome. I think we have everything we need here. So now that we've done that, Let's take a look inside of our index.js. So we're going to start inside of index.js. <laughs> it just says prone. I even misspelled that. There you go. <laughs> All right. So inside of our index.js, we can see that we've got a few things here. I'm going to get rid of this import statement for index.css because we deleted that. So we don't want to have an import here for something that doesn't exist. So I'm going to get rid of that. Okay. And I'm going to get rid of this web vitals thing because we got rid of that as well. And then I'm going to add an import statement here for bootstrap. If we want bootstrap to work with our entire app, um, we need to import it here. So import and then, um, I'll copy and paste this, and then I'll put it in chat for you so you don't have to type it out. We're essentially just bringing in Bootstrap, which is going to use it globally for us. 
and allow us to use those bootstrap styles anywhere that we want. So this is the statement. Bootstrap disk CSS bootstrap.min. Um, so that's all you need there. And then this is essentially, um, React is like a tree. And so this is kind of like the, um, the, the, the root of the tree. So our, it's gonna, and then these, those roots are gonna hook into that HTML and render there. So our entire app lives inside this tag. Um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna populate that app inside of our app.js file. And I don't think we need to change anything else here. This is where we're rendering it. And I'm gonna save this. Oh, and I'm also gonna get rid of this report web vitals thing, sorry. Last thing we're getting rid of here is this report web vitals. We don't need that. There we go. That should do it. Okay. So I'll, I'll pause here for a second so you can see all the changes that we made inside of index.js. And you can always look at the finished um, uh, repo as well. All right, now that we've done that, let's go ahead and set up our app.js. So you notice there's already code in here. Um, and this is code that's just put in, you know, automatically by the create react app application. We're gonna get rid of most of this. Um, so I'm just gonna get rid of everything um, inside of this return statement. And if you're not familiar with react, return statements are essentially where the visual elements of your component live. So anything inside of a return statement uh, is essentially generally going to be tags and it's going to be similar to HTML. Um, basically the display, how you want this component to display on the screen. And so everything that lives inside of this component here app, um, this is, you know, that, that logo that was on the screen. Uh, it's the, uh, the, the text that was on the screen when we first fired it up. Um, it's got the links and all that stuff. And then, you know, links to the documentation, all those things. And so that's what all of this is for. The, everything inside this return statement is the visual elements. And then everything above the return statement, which we will see in some components, is the logic. And so it's kind of like um, JavaScript and HTML living together inside of like a single function. This is one function, but it can contain both logic and display elements. And that's another cool thing about React. Um, it allows you to incorporate logic and, um, uh, and appearance together in one. All right, so uh, I'm gonna get rid of everything inside the return statement. And we're gonna fill that out with um, other things. Uh, so I'll save that. Sounds like PHP, maybe so. I, I don't know PHP, so I can't, um, you know, I, I can't tell you that for sure, but uh, I'm also gonna get rid of these imports here. These This is the logo and the CSS that we already got rid of. So goodbye. Uh, we're gonna be adding some additional imports here. Engineer Moore says, I think it's odd we harp on separation of concerns, but then shove everything into one framework. Yeah, so the official React documents, um, they do talk a little bit about separation of concerns and what that means to them. Um, and I'm afraid I can't recall their exact um, explanation of how they view separation of concerns, but the, the official docs do talk about that. And so I would suggest going to the docs and, and, and reading up on that a little bit and how React views separation of concerns in their world. Um, it made sense at the time. I, I don't remember what they said, but it made sense at the time. So I would suggest going and, and taking a look at that. Mattel says, the little bit of it I have seen seems to be inline logic that would work on the HTML directly. Yes, and, and actually we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but what we're writing here is not actually HTML, uh, it's JSX, which is its own language, um, which incorporates things that look like HTML tags, but aren't. It's all logic under the hood. Archangel says, do you prefer Mongo over something like Cassandra? Welcome to the stream, by the way. Um, I actually prefer SQL. 
<laughs> I prefer re relational databases. <laughs> I'm a I'm a senior SQL developer by day. Uh, this is my this is this is what I do for fun on the weekends. Uh, so yeah, I I prefer I prefer SQL. But <laughs> ew, ah, come on. <laughs> Oh, and thank you for linking that article there, uh, Esther. I appreciate that, uh, talking about separation concerns. And yes, and there is, they also talk about it in the official docs as well, but Free Code Camp is great, so go feel free to go read that. Uh, all right, so here inside of our app, uh, inside of our uh, app.js, this is where we're going to basically be importing all of our components and our page components and laying them out how they're going to be displayed visually. Uh, and we're also going to be setting up our routes. This is also where, gonna, where, where we are going to be setting up our routes and telling React how to route traffic around our app. Um, so, for example, in the um, uh, like in the in the uh, uh, in like our when somebody clicks a button or whatever, what, what, if we need to go to a new page, um, when somebody first loads the app and it goes to like the slash path. We're going to want to make sure we load the home page because we didn't set up controllers for that on our back end, right? We don't have any controllers to render the pages. So how do they know when to render? Well, React is going to do that for us. So before we populate this with all of our routes and things, uh, I'd actually like to go ahead and just create the files for our pages. Um, so we're going to deviate a little bit here. First thing, let's go ahead and build our page files um, so we can import those. So I'm going to build three pages here. One of them is going to be our home page, homepage.js, uh, new post page.js, and post page.js. Now, essentially, what these are going to equate to is really just the home page, which is this right here. Uh, the new post page right here and the full text of the blog post right here. So three separate pages, which are going to be in three separate files. Mattel says, uh, SQL, SQL developer by day, anarchist react programmer by night. There you go. I don't know about anarchist, but, uh, at the very least, I, uh, I like to provide free content so you don't have to pay for it. Archangel says, or sorry, Angel says, by the way, have you heard of Surreal DB? You might like it. Okay, I'll take a look. I haven't heard of it, but there's all there's all sorts of new databases out there and things. So now inside of each of these, this is where we're going to create uh, essentially how our individual pages are going to look. And then we're going to bundle them together inside of app.js. Now, I do want to add one thing to components here as well. So if I am looking at the finished app here, I'm looking at the finished app. What's one element that is on every single page? What's something that's on every single page? If I go to, to all the places in the app, what's one element that's on every single page? Yeah, it's the nav bar. Yep. Well, text, okay, technically, yes. <laughs> Engineer Moore, you are technically correct, the best kind of correct. Um, it's the nav bar. So when we're thinking in terms of React, we like to break it down into the individual display elements. And so, yeah, we have cards, that's an element. Um, we have, you know, the page itself, that's an element. We have the nav bar, it's its own element. And since it's on every single page, we can, we can take it out, turn it into its own component and simply just reference that component on every single page. So rather than having to code the same nav bar on all three pages, we can just take that code out, bundle it up into its own little component package, and then just make a reference to it on each page. Literally, we're just going to pull it in like, a, like an HTML tag. And so that's what's cool about React. It's very modular. You build little individual modules, little individual components, and you can mix and match and stack those components however you want. And so that's what we're going to do here. In this particular app, we're not going to have very many components, but some apps will have a ton. 
So our component here is just going to be called navbar.js. And save that. Nope, oh, come on. There we go. All right, navbar.js, home page, uh, new post page, and post page. And those should be all the components that we need. Um, and let me think about how I want to do this. Let's do, um, all right, let's just go ahead and build out app.js first. So inside of app.js, uh, I'm going to go ahead and import React from React. I don't know that I necessarily have to do this anymore. I don't think it's necessarily required, but um, there you go. I do it anyway. Uh, and now we're also going to be importing, uh, we're going to need to be handling some routes. So um, I'm going to see here if I start typing, if it's going to um, do the automatic import for me. We'll see. Nope, it didn't. That's all right. So we're going to do some imports up here. I'm going to import route browser router. and routes. These are just the various tags that we're going to need in order to make sure that the router is working correctly. Don't worry too much about them. Um, we're just this and th what we're doing here is we're just aliasing this. We're just making it shorter. So we're renaming browser router to router so we don't have to type browser router because that's really long. And we're going to import that from react router dom which we installed before, right? And then we're going to import each of those pages and components that we created. So import home page from, and then the, the location. So pages, home page, and then I can copy this. Oops, post page. And new post page. Oh, yes, and that's a great point, Archangel. Angel, I will, uh, yeah. That's, I'm glad you brought that up. I will talk about that. Yep. Good, good point. Because that trip that tripped me up as well. So I'm glad you said something. And then for our uh, nav bar is going to come from components and nav bar. Okay, so now that we've imported all these things, kind of like when you're um, importing things uh, like controllers and routers on the back end, uh, now that we've imported these things, we can actually reference them and React will know where to find them. Okay? No, you're fine, Archangel. I appreciate that. I'm glad you mentioned something. So I'll build the router and then, uh, uh, yeah, then I'll, I'll, when we get to that routes tag, I'll, I'll say something about that. Nope, I appreciate it. All right, so my first tag here is just an uh, an outer tag for router. And so what this is telling React is essentially it's a router. And as, as the description says, it's a router for use in web browsers, provides the cleanest URLs. There you go. It's going to help us route traffic around the app. And then the first component that I want to display on the page is, or on every page, is our nav bar. So nav bar. And this is going to be a single tag. If you're new to React, you'll see that the, the, the tags we're using look very similar to HTML tags. But other than the color, how can I tell that these are probably not HTML tags? Just by looking at them, other than the color, how can I tell that they're probably not HTML, that there's something different? Yeah, exactly, Arwen. They have capital letters, right? They have capital letters. 
And as we'll see, you can use regular old HTML tags, anchor tags, uh, list items, all those sorts of types of things. You can you can mix regular HTML tags in inside of React components. But the way that React identifies what is a component and what's just a plain old display tag is by looking to see whether or not it starts with a capital letter. So in React, un unlike most things in JavaScript, in React, the capital letters are actually mandatory. It's not just a uh, it's not just a naming convention or whatever. It's it's actually mandatory for React to recognize these as components and not just tags. All right, now so we have our nav bar, and then we need to tell React what page to display based on what path the user is going to. So this is essentially like a switching yard for trains. We're saying, all right, depending on what path the user goes to, that's going to determine which route we visit. And so just like a switching yard for trains, this routes tag used to be called switch because it would switch between various displayed pages depending on what path you were visiting. So what, depending on what track the train comes in on or what, what track the train needs to go to, it would switch between display pages. I don't know why they named it exactly. Um, Archangel, do you know why they explained it? Or why they, um, why they renamed it from switch to routes just because it makes more sense or what? Because I feel like switch made sense. Um, and now inside of this routes tag, we identify each of our potential routes. And so when we're talking about routes here, that essentially means we just need to define each of our individual pages. So when should the home page display? When should the, um, the new post page display? And when should the individual like uh, expanded blog post page display? Archangel says problem was people were confused and switched to switch with a like with a switch statement. Okay. So yeah, switch here meaning something different than like a JavaScript switch statement. Yeah, I could, okay, that makes sense. I get it. Yeah, so now it's all, it's using the same word, router, routes, and route. Okay, I see that. Fair enough. So we're gonna have some individual route tags here. And these are gonna be single tags, so they don't need an open and closing. They just need, um, they're, they're, they're single tags sort of like an image tag or an anchor tag, right? Zach Backstrom just followed. Oh, thank you for the follow, Zach. Um, so sort of like an image or sort of like an anchor tag where you would put a link. Um, that's how we define our route tag here. So the path that we're going to be using is just the slash, right? And the element that we want to display when somebody visits that slash path is our homepage like that. All right. So we say, all right, they visit the, they visit the slash route when they do display the homepage. But you'll notice that the nav bar is outside of this. So the nav bar is always going to display no matter what page they're going to, the nav bar will always be there. However, it'll display a different page depending on which path they go to. So I hope that makes sense. Posts, and then new is going to display the new post page. Like so. And then last one. Posts ID is going to display the page that contains the uh, specific post that the user clicked on element and then post page. Uh, Archangel asks, uh, is this completely beginner course you're doing? Uh, kind of, yeah. We've already gone through the React docs here on stream, um, but I'm trying to make it accessible for folks that maybe have only built traditional um, like JavaScript, HTML, CSS apps. So it's a fine line to walk as far as, you know, keeping the folks who have been through the React docs somewhat, you know, 
on uh, up to speed with me, but then also hopefully bringing along a few folks who just want to learn more about what React is and what it can do and how it compares to a regular um, CRUD app. So kind of beginner. <laughs> All right, each of our routes here. Oh yeah, and uh, Archangel says you can nest route in route if that makes sense. So you could have potentially, oh, okay, I, I don't know what I've done that before. Um, but yeah, so you can have potentially some nested routes as well. Wow, I guess if things are getting complex, that makes sense. Yeah, and as Dev said, they haven't gone through the docs yet either. All right, so we've got all these things where we're referenced, we're displaying the appropriate page based on whatever path we're visiting, right? Oh, okay, yeah, I, I get you, Archangel. So it's, um, you can have a route slash post, and then inside that you can have new and ID, yes. Um, so if you have a, a URL that has multiple parts, so sometimes URLs can have, you know, multiple, like, uh, potential paths between the slashes, right? So you could have, a post route and then um, then new and then ID. So yes, I'm gonna keep these separate because I think it's clearer this way, but I, I yes, I, I understand what you're saying now. Yes, I get you. That's a good point. And that would make sense, I think, if you had um, lots of kind of sub routes as well. All right, now we've built our, um, we built our component here our overall app component, which contains all of our other components inside of it. It contains multitudes. Uh, and then the most important part that I forget all the time when you're building a component is that you have to not only import what you need, but then when you're done, you have to export the component itself. This allows um, anything else to reference it and it allows uh, your program to know where it is and render it appropriately. So I always forget the export. <laughs> all right. Now let's go ahead and build, let's build our homepage next, I think. Mm. Actually, no, let's build new post page. Sorry, I'm skipping around. I'm just trying to think of um, sort of somewhat gentle ways to, uh, to show some similarities between um, regular CRUD apps and React. So let's do new post page. And then we'll do post page and then we'll do the home page. Yeah. All right. So inside of new post page, we're going to need to do a couple imports first off, um, because inside of new post page, uh, we're going to be performing several actions, right? Uh, new post page is essentially a form. And um, it's going to, you know, contain all those form objects. Uh, it's going to contain some buttons. Um, it's going to, for styling purposes, this form is going to exist inside of a container. Um, when, uh, after we click the create button, so after I enter all this information and I click create, I'm going to want to make sure that I'm taken back to the home page um, so I can see the new post that was just created, right? I want to be able to see what I just put in. So we're going to have to have some navigation here to uh, route to a specific location once I click create. And so we're going to need to import a few of the tools that are going to help us do that. So first off, I'm going to import uh, React and use state. So we'll talk a little bit about state in a minute, but it's also a very important part of React. I'm also going to import Axios, which we installed earlier. So Axios is pretty similar to fetch. And what do we use fetch for? If you're familiar with fetch, what do we use fetch for?
Yeah, uh, we use fetch for retrieving data or API calls. <laughs> Mattel says probably getting something. Yes, you're exactly right. Fetch is for getting something. Um, it's an ABI essentially, but it, what it helps us do is, yeah, retrieve data from somewhere else. Maybe it's an out, maybe it's an external API. Um, maybe it's, you know, our own API that we've built. Uh, maybe it's just a, you know, a general URL, we're getting something. Um, but yeah, it, it helps us, it helps us go and get something from somewhere else. But there's other ways to do that aside from fetch. Um, Sorry, I need to make sure I get this right. React Bootstrap, there we go. Um, there's other ways to do that other than fetch. And one of those ways is Axios, which you may see used. Um, I, I think it's it, it has some additional functionality other than fetch, um, but I think it's primarily used for backwards compatibility um, and it, because it works with pretty much every browser ever, uh, including like Internet Explorer 3 or whatever. I don't know. Um, form button and container and so we're going to use axios to do our fetching today uh, but you'll what you'll see is it's very similar to fetch uh, it's just a slightly different way of um, of writing it and so like i said before i like to try to use these different tools on occasion i'll swap back and forth um, just to make sure that we don't get too complacent using the same thing every single time um, and that you can recognize alternate ways of doing things and not be like, oh my God, I've never seen this before, right? So that's what we're gonna do. It's very similar though, don't panic. All right, I think the first thing I'm gonna do is make sure that my um, React component is gonna be able to handle the routing and post, um, basically when, it, when somebody clicks the submit button, I wanna make sure that two things can happen. I wanna make sure that I'm routed back to the homepage and that a request is sent to my API, the API that we built in the first hour. I wanna make sure that that request is sent to that API and that it's sent to the correct controller. So it's going down the correct path, it's set to the correct controller um, and it submits that post to the database. So two things need to happen here. And for that, um, for that, we're going to need to have a function to do that. So it's kind of like we're building a controller, except we're building it here within React. So all of our logic, whether it's like calculation logic or it's display elements, all of those are going to be contained in a single component. So we're going to have our component called new post page. And we can write it just like we would an arrow function. So it's going to look just like a function, except once again, capital letter. So it's actually a component. And inside of there, I'm going to have a sub function here called handle submit. So it's going to handle those two things that we talked about when somebody submits Thank you for the follow. Just Thank you for the follow, Sirish. Um, so when somebody submits, we need to send a request up to the API saying, hey, somebody just built a new post, take this data and write it to the database, and then also send the user back to the homepage. So on submit, I'm gonna have an async function because I'm talking to, um, I'm talking to an outside entity, I'm talking to my API, which is not in the same project, it's somewhere else, so async, and I'm going to be passing in an event. So we'll talk about that as well. First thing is, I'm going to do e.preventDefault. Now, we've talked about prevent default before, and let's think about what's actually happening here. I have a form, I'm going to have a form, and I'm going to have a submit button. And when I click that submit button, by default, HTML forms have certain things that they do. Um, number one, uh, they send out, uh, they automatically send out a request, uh, it's a get request, I think by default, they send out a get request by default with the form data inside of it. And so if there's a server listening for that request, it'll pick it up and it refreshes the page and clears the form. That's just something that HTML forms do 
that's how they work. Um, but we don't want that stuff to happen. We want to control how this form behaves. One of the big principles of React is that we want to have total control over behavior and display, how things look, how they behave. And so first thing we do is that when this click event happens, that's what this E is for. It's the, it's the event, the, the thing that we did, the click. Um, we want to stop any default behavior that that button may have had. So prevent default is something you'll see a lot inside of React applications because HTML tags have all these things that are, you know, that happen automatically and are supposed to be helpful, but we want to control all of that behavior ourselves. And so when somebody clicks that submit button, it's not going to do anything without us telling it to, unless we told it to do that thing, right? So now we are taking over its behavior. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm going to send a request out to my API. So I'm going to await axios.post. This is very similar to fetch. Um, axios.post. And I'm essentially just going to hit my API. So HTTP colon backslash backslash localhost. And I did mine at 5,500. Yours may be on a different server. That's okay. Just make sure that you match the server that your, that your API is running on. Mine's on 5,500. Um, if we, uh, so my server.js is on 5,500. So I'm, I want to make sure I'm talking to it. And if you recall in the paths that we set up on our server previously, this is the path that we told our server. So if I have a post request, right? A post request going to the posts path, that's telling our server to talk to the database and save the data as a, as a new post in the database, okay? So we're hitting that path. We're sending a post request on the post path and, oops, and that's gonna tell it to do exactly that. All right, get back to that. So post and the post path hitting our localhost API. Engineer says, is there a reason for using just E instead of event? Uh, e is just an abbreviation for event, yes. So you may see it written out as event like that, um, but just as often I think you'll see it as E. Uh, and so it's important that you know what E is. E is just the thing that happened. Uh, it could be a hover. It could be a key press. Um, it could be a, a click. It could be a scroll. It's, a, it's an interaction, a, a thing that just occurred. Um, if you go back in my YouTube archives, you'll see that we, uh, a long time ago, we built a Wordle clone, so the game Wordle. Um, and we had to listen for every single, you know, users are typing in the boxes, right, um, to, to, to guess words. And so we had to listen for every single key press. And we did that by listening for those key press events and then reacting accordingly. Uh, hey, Lugo, welcome to the stream. Oh, you got your job because of Leon's course? That's friggin' rad. It's awesome. Uh, you stopped in June 2022. You want to start the new cohort to learn full stack web dev. Any news in the next cohort? Yes, uh, it is coming soon. Uh, hopefully before. Uh, I'm not going to be too specific because I don't know. Um, but hopefully before the end of the year. Hopefully by the end of the summer, maybe. But please don't take my word on that. Um, yeah, I mean, we would love to have you in the new cohort. Um, you can start picking up the, the previous classes anytime on YouTube, though. That's awesome that you got your job uh, from Leon, though. That's rad. So we've done our first part. We've sent the request to the API with the data. And the next part of that is navigating. Navigating back to the home page. All right. So now there are two things that we need to accomplish there. Those should be done. So when somebody clicks that submit button, it'll send the request to the API, the post request, and it'll send the user back to the home page. All right. Oh, and sorry, I forgot to specify here in the, um, we need to also 
uh, we're sending a post request, but we also need to explicitly specify the method that we're using. And so in this case, here's where we're visiting, here's the method we're using. So path method, there we go. And then we navigate back to home and that's the first function that we're taking care of. Hey, search. <laughs> Leon mentioned September. Okay. Yeah, he may have done. Yeah. <laughs> the hiring manager says I can use, choose the language in the interview. So I did full JS. That's friggin' rad. That's awesome. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Obi, you're right. You are correct. I misspoke here. So this isn't the method. This is the actual data that we're sending. And I, I confused myself because I used the same name for the method and the object, which is probably not the best idea. So great catch there, Obi. So this is the post method. So we talked about post, uh, we talked about get, post, put, patch, delete, right? This is the method. And then this is the actual object that we are sending over to the API. So this, is, this contains the, the post title, author, content. It's a big, it's just a big old JSON object. Yeah, so you're correct there. My apologies, Obi, I got that wrong. Good catch. All right, now uh, that's the first uh, thing we need to handle. Now, the second thing we need to handle, and we, we do need to take a break here. So the next thing we need to handle is capturing the information that people are entering. So while I am typing in this form, while I'm, you know, entering in each of these, each of these fields, as I said before, we want to control the behavior of this form and we want to capture everything that's being entered so we can bundle it up and send it over to our API. And the way that React does that is something called state. And state is essentially kind of like a variable that tells React how the page should look to the user at any given time. Um, state is kind of a big, a big meaty concept, but essentially it's, it's just a way of holding data and using that, that data to tell React how the page should look at a given point at any given time. Okay. So. The next thing we're going to do, and we are, we'll, we'll, we'll take a break first, but the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a piece of state that's going to be capturing all of the form data as it is being entered. Okay, so as the form data is being entered, we're going to be capturing it live and storing it inside of a post object so that as soon as the user hits submit, that object is ready to go, bundled up, and sent over to the API. All right, so we're going to take a five minute break and then we come back, we're going to finish this page and we're going to set up, you know, all, actually all the display elements, like all this is set up right now. We're, we're making sure that we have our behavior set up and then we're going to set up all of our display elements and uh, make sure it looks good. Okay. Uh, Dev asked, can Axios handle method overrides allowing put requests from a form or does that still need to be handled on the back end? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Anybody who's familiar with Axios, uh, feel free to answer that. <laughs> or feel free to, we can Google it over the break and then <laughs> we can come back with the answer. Yeah, Esther says, I was going to say, we have the post from the HTTPS posting and the post from a post in the blog, a little confusing. Yeah, I could have named that better. Uh, feel free, you can change the name on your end as long as you keep things consistent. Yeah, you can call it publication, content, blog post, whatever you like. Yep. You just need to make sure that your um, controller on the server side is listening for that new name. So make sure that it knows what it's being sent. Okay. Try to keep things consistent across the board. All right. Five minute break. Up, up, up. I can find my timer. There we go. Reset that. And I will see you all back here in five minutos. All right.
All right, folks, we got about a minute left in the break. And um, Deb Philipper, I was thinking about your question. And actually, I think that, um, you know, Axios can handle pretty much any method that you throw at it. Um, and since in React, we're kind of um, taking away that default form behavior, you know, the, the, the fact that forms can only handle certain methods, we're, we're, we're taking away that behavior from it entirely. Um, and so really, yeah, I, I think the method doesn't matter when we're working with Axios, uh, when, when we're working with React in general, is that we are controlling that form behavior instead of relying on the default behavior. So we can specify whatever method we want. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the timer. All right, there we go. Yes, yeah, and then the, that's, again, that's kind of the, the point of React is that we are, we wanna control every aspect of behavior. Uh, and so we're, we're taking away the default, any de default behavior from the form and we're just controlling it ourselves however we want, yeah. So we're handling submit there. And now we, we talked about before the break, we talked a little bit about state, right? And, and state again is a very important um, aspect of React. And what state does for us is it allows us to um, store certain data elements. We, we choose which data elements we want to store. We store them inside of a special type of a variable that React looks at that variable and sees what's in it and then makes decisions about what to display based on what's in that variable or what to do based on what's in that variable. And so state variables are special, but they are still variables. And so inside of my above my camel submit here, I'm going to, I'm going to initialize my state variable and tell it what we're going to store in there. So we'll talk about, we'll talk more about what these elements are and what they mean in just a second. But this is how you declare a state variable. You say set post and then set post. And then we say use state. And this, you'll see this is very standard across any and all state variables that you're going to declare. And inside of this variable, I'm going to be storing all of the information that people are typing in the form. Rather than relying on the form itself to hold the data, I'm going to hold that data myself. Okay? So we're going to just all the elements, title, uh, author, oops, author, uh, image, and content. And I'm setting these all as empty by default because this is the, 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 the way that our state starts out. So each time somebody goes to that page, they wanna see an empty form, all fields empty. And so that's what we're doing here. We're saying, all right, all these fields should start out empty. And then as the user types in them, they're going to be populated with whatever the user is typing in real time. But we want them to start out empty. And you'll often see that with state, um, things will start out as null or empty strings. Um, unless you have a Boolean, it might start as true or false and then flip depending on what the user does. Um, now the second, so the, the first part of this declaration is the actual variable where we're gonna be storing that stuff. And so that's what we're passing to our API. So we've got post, and that's gonna contain everything that the user has typed as soon as they hit submit. And then we're bundling that up. It's just an object and we're sending it off to the API. The second part of this is actually a function. And what this is, is a default function that's going to fire off every time the user presses on a key. So every time the user presses a key in a form field, it's going to fire this function and it's going to populate the appropriate um, part of this state. So if they're typing in the author form, it's going to put in there whatever they typed. Uh, if, they, if they're typing in title, it's going to put that in there. Image, content, whatever. Wherever they're typing, this function is going to fire and it's going to fill in this state variable. 
Uh, Mattel says, can you set them there to set a default state? Yes, that's what we're doing here. This is what, what this is, this is the default. This is the default state of the variable, which will then be updated every time we call set post. So this is the, the in use state, whenever you call use state, when you're declaring a, use, uh, a state variable, what you put inside of these parentheses is the default value of that state variable. Hey, Ahmed, good to see you. I hope that answers your question. I hope I read that correctly. So now that we've, we've declared this, um, we can use it in other places. Uh, now, the next thing I wanna do here is I'm, I'm gonna declare a variable called navigate. And that's just going to call on use navigate, which is this just this kind of our, our router down here. So const navigate equals use navigate. And that's how we can send people from page to page. And what this essentially doing is doing is it's hitting that router that we set up earlier. We set up our router and that's listening for traffic. And so we can make calls to that router and send traffic and route people from page to page. Mattel says, if you want a default value other than null in the page, yes, you could, you could have, this doesn't have to be empty. Um, state variables don't have to be null when you, when you first declare them. Um, they usually are because you generally want like blanks, but uh, inside of the form itself, what I would, if we're talking about a form, uh, having default values in a form, what I would do instead there, in, instead of putting things in here, is form fields, input boxes, have a, an attribute that you can set called placeholder. So that's what I would do instead, is I would, I would set that placeholder value inside of the form field itself, and then override it, you know, that, that gets automatically overwritten once the user starts typing. So I would use the placeholder attribute in the form field. Uh, line 12, no problem with the extra comma. Yeah, it, it's not gonna cause a problem. Uh, in JavaScript, you can do that. You can have an extra comma, but I'll take it out. Um, that's fine. Yeah. No worries. You notice it didn't give me any kind of error there because it that's kosher for some reason. Okay, now we want to, um, we, we've declared our state variable. Now we wanna make sure it, get, it gets populated every single time that the user types something in a form box. So we're gonna have a new function here called handle change. And this is what's gonna be called an event handler. So similar to something like an event hit listener or a Smurf, if you're a hundred devs person, um, this is gonna be something very similar. It's gonna be listening for the user to do something and then it's going to update that state variable every time the user does something. <laughs> Serge, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you like my explanations. <laughs> I'm not a teacher. Uh, I, don't, I don't get paid to be a teacher, um, but I do enjoy it. So I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you. All right. So handle change. Once again, we're listening for an event here. Um, but in this case, it's a different event, right? This right here, handle submit, this is what happens when somebody clicks that button. So it's listening for a click here. However, what this is going to be listening for is a key press. A key press within a form box. So when somebody presses a key press within the form box, we're going to call set post to update our state based on whatever box they were typing in. Now, how do we know where they were typing? Hmm. Well, what's nice is that that event, so this event object contains a bunch of different information. Um, Sometimes you can try console logging uh, the value of E. If you ever do that, if you ever console log E, um, you'll see that there's a crap ton of information stored in there. Every mouse click, every keyboard press is sending a bunch of information and you're only ever going to use uh, like a tiny subset of it. But we are going to use a little bit of it here. So set post. First thing we're going to do is we're going to keep all the other fields the same. So we're going to use a, um, oh, what is that called? When you, when you um, break an object out, an existing object out into its parts. A spread. Yes, spread operator. So we're going to take all the existing, um, so let's say there's already data in the author, image, and content fields, and I start typing in title. I don't want it to overwrite everything else. So I'm going to take all the existing data that's there, 
and then I'm going to add what's currently being typed to that existing data. So that's all I'm doing here. Take all the existing data and then what's after the comma here is going to get added. So how do I know where, where they're typing? Well, I don't. I don't have to. That information is enclosed inside of the event data that's being passed with that key press. So the, that, key press, the, the, that key press knows exactly where they are and what they're typing. So e.targetName colon e.target.value. All right. So what's happening here is we're going into that event object and this target name is literally the name of the box where they're typing. And then the value is what they were typing. So where they were typing and what they were typing. And what that's going to equate to is the name of the box they were typing in. So title. And then whatever key they actually pressed. Okay. So I would suggest that, you know, if you have time sometime and you're working with like an event or whatever, console log it and see everything that's in there and you'll be amazed at how much stuff is being passed. And then you're only really just accessing a tiny bit of it. So it's kind of neat. All right. So every time they type something, it's going to record where they're typing and then assign that value into the appropriate spot in the state. All right. I think that's all the pre-work that we needed to do there. Now we can go through and set up our return statement. So what is actually going to be displayed to the user when they visit the new post page? So everything inside the return is the visual elements, right? It's the tags. It's how it looks. It's the form. Everything that's visually displayed is going to go inside the return. Some jazzy hands and keyboardy hands. <laughs> uh, Dev says, is that event resource hungry if it's tracking all events on the page? No, it's only tracking a specific event. It's only tracking the specific event that's happening when handle change is called. I don't know the exact mechanics of how it works, but events are very standard. You'll see them in all different kinds of apps. Um, and it only it only um, passes that data when the uh, when the specific when the specific um, you know hand, when a handle change is called it's going to say all right what what was happening when that was called what's the information about that and then it's going to use that but yeah events are really standard you'll see them a lot of places even not outside of React this is not a React thing this E is not a React thing um, you can use it in almost any app. All right, so what do we want to return? Well, we want to return a form, right? Um, but we're going to style that a little bit using React Bootstrap to make it look a little bit less, I don't know, HTML-y. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and put everything inside of my form inside of a container. And this is a you know, React component, but it's a, boots, it's a Bootstrap React component. It's, uh, it's Bootstrap that's made to work with React. So we have a container. I'm going to give it a class name of uh, mt4 that's just going to put a little bit of a margin on top of it and inside of that container i'm going to have a form oops capital form so it's a it's a react component so it needs to be capitalized and when that um when that submit button is clicked i want to call my handle submit function so on submit Instead of doing the default behavior, I'm calling this specific event handler. So an event has occurred on submit, call that event handler. Hey, Kailondo, good to see you. <laughs> wow, I missed a lot of Sundays. That's okay. That's what the VODs are for. That's what my YouTube channel is for as well. Uh, and now inside of, um, inside of this form, I'm going to have multiple input boxes so each of which contains a well four input boxes each of which contains a label and the box itself 
And so for styling purposes, I'm going to group each of those inside of a form group. And that's just a thing that Bootstrap uses to make things look a little nicer. So I'm going to have four of those. It just kind of it just kind of puts the label and the input box closer together. Um, it just makes it look better. So form group. And then inside of each of those groups, I'm going to have a label. a label and the input box itself. And that'll be a form control. And that is a single tag. There we go. And we're going to fill this out more, but for now I'm just going to copy and paste these in four times. Okay, so we have all four, two, three, four. Um, my first form is gonna have a, just be called title. Oh, thank you, Marco, I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, we have done lots of fun projects, Kailando, absolutely. My favorite uh, recently has been the, the kitten store and the cat book, those were really fun. So title, author, um, image URL and was the last one content. All right, those are our labels. And then inside the form control is where the action happens. So this is this is what we're where we specify what type of input it is. Um, what information we want to uh, what, what we're storing in there and what we want to happen when users interact with that input box. So our form control is going to be a type of um, text, not test, text. There we go. Type of text. Um, it's going to have a name of title. This is what's going to get stored in that target name field. So right here, e.target.name is going to be looking at this field right here, name title. And then I'm also going to have some placeholder text. So what I was talking about before, I think, Mattel, you were asking about setting default values and things. Um, you can just set placeholder text directly in a form field. So just by setting this placeholder attribute. So that hopefully that'll do you do you, what you wanted to do there. And then now what happens when people inter in, interact with this box? Well, I want it to call my handle change function and update the state as they're typing. So type name, placeholder value and on change. So event handler, it listens for interaction of any kind, and uh, it then calls this function every single time. Every time you type a key, it's calling this handle change function over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Multiple times, as many times as you interact with the, with the box. Yeah, that's where you call handle change. Yep, on change, handle change. And these are what are called event handlers. And I draw the comparison to event listeners, right? We know what event listeners are. You've used those a bunch of times. On click, right? On click, on scroll, on hover. Um, and really that's that's what you're doing here. Anytime there's an interaction, you are calling something else, calling a function. Smurfs, yep, it is. It's, it's, it's just React's version of Smurfs. That's all it is. It's not anything new or unexpected. It's an event listener in React. They call it event, event handlers. Okay, so that's all we need to do there. And then for author, it's going to be very similar. So I'm just going to actually like copy this. Text, our name is going to be author. Uh, playful, placeholder is going to be author. And then once again, we're going to call the same function for each one. Laminis just followed. <laughs> Laminis, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. And again, image URL. So name is just going to be, in this case, just going to be image. Uh, placeholder is going to be image URL. And then on change, handle change. Uh, last one, 
same thing, except this one's going to be slightly different because this is content, right? This is long form content. I could be pasting multiple paragraphs in here and that would suck. I, I hate it when websites do this. This is a pet peeve of mine, but when websites expect you to have a long answer, like to type multiple sentences, but all they give you is a tiny little like one line input box. What should they have you, what should they use instead? What, what should they use to allow you to enter a paragraph or, or five paragraphs? What's the, what's, what would be the best thing for, what, what would be the best type to use here instead of text? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, Laminus, yeah. Y'all are, y'all are way smarter than a lot of website designers. Um, we need to use text area, which allows for multi-line input. I don't know why that's so hard, but so many websites get that wrong. And then we can even specify how many rows you want to give them. So I think I said three, um, but you could say five or whatever, it, it, whatever you want. That just shows how big it is by default. You can click, they can click and drag in the bottom corner to make it bigger, but um, that just, that's the default. So name is going to be content. Um, placeholder is going to be content and on change, handle change. Awesome. And then in order to complete our form, in order to complete our form, what is the last element that I need to add? I've got all my input boxes. Um, you know, I've got my styling stuff here. I've got what, what happens when they, when they on submit handle submit. So what, what's the last thing I need? Yeah, exactly. We need the actual submit button. Button. And again, this is going to be uppercase. Uh, we're using uppercase tags here just because uh, it's bootstrap. Uh, it's bootstrap react styling stuff. So um, the text that's going to be displayed there just going to be create. And then I can give it a variant of primary for styling purposes. And then the type is very important because that's going to tell um, react to call that on submit function. So submit button, the type needs to be submit in order to trigger this to fire, to, to trigger our handle submit, which is going to hit our database and navigate the user back to home. Okay. Button full container. All right. I think that's everything we need here for our new post page. So we, we set our state, we set our navigation. Um, we know what to do when somebody's typing in the box. We know what to do when somebody clicks the submit button. And that's really the only type of user interaction that we can do here. Um, the nav bar is already being handled. The nav bar is going to be, is, is handled at the app level. It's going to exist on every page already. So we don't have to handle it here. Um, and then our return is showing all the visual elements of the form on submit. It'll call our handle submit function, which sends that request to the API. Um, and then every time they type in the box, each of these boxes, it's going to call handle change, uh, which will keep track of which box they're typing in and what they're typing. So that should be everything we need here for new post page. Next, let's go ahead and go over to the um, individual post page, I think. We'll do that next. Um, Any questions before we leave new post? Uh, Esther says, can we check if it worked? Um, maybe we can see, we can see if it, we can see if it'll uh, let us get there. We aren't going to be able to do, we aren't going to be able to, to um, do submits yet because we haven't built our homepage. Um, so if it's going to try to route to you know, it's going to try to navigate to home, but we haven't built the home page yet. So you wouldn't be able to submit anything. You might be able to display the page, um, but it's probably going to actually, I don't know if it'll even compile without uh, us building everything out first. We can try it, but it's probably going to be really mad. Yeah, let's see. What was that? What, what path am I using for new posts? I forget. So yeah, it, it doesn't, um, 
module. Oh, module has both. I forgot the export. Oh my goodness. Ah, I do that every single time. Every single time. I always forget to actually export my components. I don't know why I just do. So you can input, you have to, once you build a component, that's only half the battle. You actually have to export it so that it can be used elsewhere in the app. Okay, now it compiled, but it's still not gonna run properly because um, we don't have, we haven't built all of our components yet. Yeah. <laughs> Happens so easily. Yeah, exactly. And search, search, search caught it there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, handle change does uh, lemon assess does handle change not have to be async oh wait I don't think so we're not we're not talking to any external entity here um, we're just all we're doing is setting state so as they're typing it's just going to fire and an, an update state as they go yeah okay let's go over to the post page It just renders a state. Yeah, so it's gonna just, uh, you know, re-render anything that needs to be re-rendered and, and update state as we go. Yeah. Now, a lot of this is gonna be somewhat similar to um, the new post page. So I think we can actually probably copy a lot of these import statements. So I'm gonna do that. I'm just gonna grab my import statements here. So that way I don't have to type them out again. Uh, we've got, use state. We're also going to have use effect here. Use effect, use state from React, Axios, um, and from React Bootstrap, we're going to have card and container. And we're also going to have, um, instead of use navigate here, we're going to have use params. There we go. Okay, I think that's everything. Yeah, as, as Archangel says, with handle change, you don't need to, yeah, you're not waiting on anything. It's just updating as you go. Yep. Okay, so I think those are all the imports that we need. And now we can build out our components. So similar to the way we did before, I'm gonna build out post page, just like I would a regular function, except it's capitalized. That indicates it's a component. And I'm gonna grab my state from over here. So we're gonna be using the same state as we did in new post page. So I can just copy that. And another thing I'm gonna declare here is use params. So we'll talk about how this is gonna be used in just a second. Oops, use params, there we go. And essentially all we're gonna be doing here is a fetch. We're gonna be, when, when somebody clicks on a certain um, post on the homepage, when they click, you know, view post or whatever, um, it's gonna take them to a page where all of that post content is gonna be displayed. The, the image, the title, the author, the content. And so in order to do that, we're gonna need to go to a fetch. We're gonna go out to the API, fetch all that data for that one post, and then render it out. And so what use params is gonna help us do is essentially um, access that, um, essentially it's access the ID of the post that the user clicked on, the post that they wanna see, grab that ID and send it out to our API. So use params is literally referring to the params that we talked about before, the, the things that are getting passed in. If we go over to the server here, the thing, this, this right here, 
when you're on a route, you have you can have params in that route. And what we're doing here is we're going into the route, we're grabbing the ID value, extracting it from that path, and we're gonna send it up to our API, uh, our outside API in a brand new path. So we'll see how that looks in just a second. It probably doesn't make sense right now, but we'll see how that looks in a sec. So in order to do that, in order to make that outside call from React, I'm gonna use effect. And this is similar to use state. It has you know, a similar name, right? Instead of use state, we're doing use effect. And this is what's called a hook. So React, newer React has things called hooks um, and use state, use effect, uh, those are hooks. So they're built into React to do certain things. And what we're doing here is use effect allows us to um, essentially perform an operation. Um, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. It allows us to perform an operation once and then perform it again if certain conditions are met. So it doesn't have to be necessarily when, you know, the pay, when, when a component re-renders or anything like that. It can operate outside of all of that. And since we're hitting an API here, since we're hitting an API, we don't want to, I don't know, recall the, re-hit the API every single time the user clicks somewhere on the screen or um, types in a box or whatever like that. We, if the component is changing, we don't want to keep calling the API over and over and over again. That's bad. APIs don't like that. Um, so we're going to use use effect to basically control this and say, all right, we're going to hit the API once. And then no matter what else happens on the page, we only hit the API once, not again. Um, and so that's what use effect can help us do. And you'll see use effect use a lot when you are talking to outside entities such as APIs. Arkhangel says, what do you mean? APIs love being load tested. Yeah, right. <laughs> I think 100 devs actually killed an API one time because we were all trying to hit it at once. So use effect can help protect us from doing that, from being silly with hitting APIs too many times. All right, so again, we're gonna do a fetch here. It's gonna be async because we wanna wait for a response back from our API. And our response is going to, we're gonna await that. It's gonna be a fetch using Axios and we're gonna do a git request out to our API. So I'm gonna copy this because I'll get it wrong otherwise, but we'll talk about it. So I'm hitting my local server at 5,500 on the posts path, and I'm passing in the ID that I retrieved from what the user clicked on. The user clicks on a card on the homepage, which contains information about the ID, um, you know, all that, that, that database information, uh, the title, the content, the ID, everything. I'm extracting the ID from the path, and then I'm passing it back in here when we go out to our external API. So I'm taking the ID from the internal route, the route from the homepage to here, and I'm dropping it in to this external path out to our API. All right, and then after that's retrieved, I'm gonna store that, that post information, all the, all the data I get back from the database. I'm gonna store that inside of my state variable. So. Anything I get back from the database right here is going to be stored inside of my state right here and then displayed on the page to the user. <laughs> I murdered an API once because I was testing my org system and it hit an API that had not been scaled fully with 2.5 million requests per minute. Oh my God. That'll, yeah. As Engineer Moore says, that'll do it. Yep. So set post and then. So we get back that response back, we set it, we store it in our state variable so we have it and we can show it to the users. And then after that, we just call fetch post. So we've declared the function here. We've declared the function here and then we immediately call it. We declare it and we call it. So anytime, um, the, the, this page is rendered, 
since, since we call this function right here immediately, anytime the page renders, it's going to run fetch post, get the post data, and show it. All right, and then we just finish here with use effect. And basically say, hey, all right, use effect is going to run, and it's going to run once, unless the ID of the post that we've requested is changed. So if that ID were somehow to change, then use effect would run again and call fetch post. So fetch post won't, we won't keep hitting the API over and over and over again, unless the ID of the post that we are trying to fetch changes. Mistletar, thank you for the follow. Yes, correct. As, as Archangel says, if you recall, in our paths, we are able to retrieve this ID because we, we put in ID as a param on that path. Yep. Yes, the ID is a param. We, we talk, like we talked about, ID is a parameter in the URL. We're able to retrieve it and then pass it to our API. Yeah. Okay. Now, we've done that, so let's set up our return statement. Now that we have the behavior in place, we can set up the display elements that are going to show on the screen. And also, yes, as somebody mentioned earlier, before I forget, <laughs> I'm going to set up my export statement right now. There we go. <laughs> So try and catch is kind of different. What try and catch does is try and catch basically allows us to fail gracefully. So if the fetch request didn't work, then um, we would want to make sure that our app was prepared for that to potentially not work. Literally, it, it, we want to make sure that our app is prepared to try, right? It's not a guarantee. It's a try. It may work. It may not. And so try catch blocks are, are what do that for us. It says, all right, app, I'm telling you to try because this may not always work. The server may be down, the database may be inaccessible, the password may be wrong, whatever. And then if that try does not work, the catch is literally going to, like, like, a, like a baseball player, it's going to catch the error and be ready to handle it and display it however it needs to be displayed. So instead of the app just crashing, Try and catch allows us to tell our app in advance, hey, this might not work. Don't freak out. Please don't crash. Just try to do it. If it doesn't work, catch the error and you know, console log it or show it to the user or whatever. Okay. Yeah, so try catch is really helpful. Um, Archangel uh, put in a try catch there. And yeah, I realized I didn't do try catches on my back end this time. That's my bad. I normally do. Um, you can look at the uh, at, at my previous repos, really any of them. Uh, you can I would suggest looking at the cat book repo for examples of try catch. Um, and you'll see that uh, those are pretty common for operations that might fail. Oh, thank you, Archangel. So <laughs> they submitted a pull request fixing my omission of try catch blocks. Yes, thank you for that. That was my uh, that was my error because yes I, I I normally do use those and they are excellent to use when you're doing things like talking to a database. Second try, yeah. <laughs> All right, so what do we want to show the users on the post page? Well, we want to show them the blog post, right? And how we're going to do that is essentially just put the whole thing in a big container and one big card. I like the way cards look. I'm, I'm simple like that. I'm a simple woman. I like cards. Um, and so we're going to have a container just really for some padding margins around the edge. Um, and we're going to have card. And the card is just going to contain all the elements of the blog post. So my container is just going to have a little bit of a margin there. And T4, margin top four. Um, and my card um, can have a little bit of, uh, we're going to have some styling there. Oh. Ah. Have a div here. And see the difference here. These components 
they're capitalized, so they turn green. They're recognized as React components. But when I use a regular HTML tag with lowercase, that's just a tag. That's going to render as a tag. It's not going to be anything special. So what I'm doing here in this div is I'm just um, Basically, I'm, I'm trying to prevent the image from getting too big for its britches. So I'm just doing a little bit of styling here to set a max height for the image so it's not huge. Max height is going to be 500 pixels. And I'm going to be putting the image inside of this div. So the div is going to enclose the image and prevent it from getting too tall. So max height is going to be 500 pixels. and I'm not an expert at styling by any means. There's probably a better way to do this, but I'll use style experts out there. You can revise this however you want. So essentially what this is gonna do is it's gonna enclose our image um, and set a max height and hide any overflow. So it'll like crop it a little bit. And inside of there, we can put our car.image. Sorry, image image, there we go, car.image, class name, image fluid. This is all just styling stuff. You can, you know, copy and paste it from the repo if you want. Um, hey, Chris, no worries. Good to see you. Glad you made it. Uh, Sir, uh, Sir says container and car to bootstrap React. Yes. Yeah. Those are bootstrap um, components that are built to work with React. Mm -hmm. All right. So the, the first two things here are class name and variant. Those are kind of styling things. Um, but the next thing is really important. So source, this is our image source. And this is going to come from that post object that we're getting back from the database. So that post object contains a, a, a key value pair where one of those is the image, you know, image is the identifier, and then what's in there is the URL. So the URL of the image that we want to display. So we go into that post, we find that image URL, and we put it as the source. And then we can have an alt tag here if we want to. Um, we can just set that to the post title. There we go. And that's all we need inside of our image tag. So we can close that tag. And below that, we're going to have the body of our card. So real quick, let's just look back at um, how this is going to look when we're done. Let me get a better one here. So what we just built there is our image container. The whole thing is enclosed in a card. So this, this kind of light border that we have here, that's a card. And then the top part is the image. So we're going to have our card title, um, card subtitle, and then the content card body is going to be down here. So just a couple more elements here. So all of this, the, the, the title, the author, all those things are going to be enclosed inside the body. And then card title will be first. And that's just going to be the post title. Whatever we're getting back from the database, whatever that title is, is just going to go here. Now, I do want to ask, um, for those of you familiar with React, why am I putting everything in these weird brackety things? Even sometimes double brackets, right? What what's all this about? Why why can't I just say you know post dot title without the without these weird curly brackets? What are these for? What do these allow us to do? If you recall, you see curly brackets a lot with React. And be to text even. Yeah, it's JSX. Yes, exactly. So as a reminder, we're not writing in HTML here, right? Even these things, these tags that look like HTML, they're not. Um, we're writing in um, we're writing in what we call JSX, which is React's um, JavaScript variant. So it's like it's like JavaScript, but with more stuff. Um, <laughs> and so whenever you see these curly brackets, 
That's essentially telling React that we are escaping from HTML tag land and we want a little window into JavaScript just for a minute. So we can use both, right? It's, it's, a, it's a mishmash of both, but we have to tell React when we're switching from one to the other, when we're switching from traditional HTML tags and component tags over to JavaScript, such as a variable, which is what we're doing here. Okay? So that's why we see these curly braces everywhere. It's a window into JavaScript. Hard subtitle, da, da, da. all right, that's all we need there. And then, so what's gonna go in here is just the byline. So by post author. So here's a great example. Inside of this tag, this by word, that's just, a, that's just text. That, there's nothing special about that. It's just static text. So I don't need to wrap that in curly braces. But this is a variable, so I do wrap it in curly braces because that's JavaScript. This is just text. This is JavaScript. <laughs> yes, it's superpower JS, exactly. That's right. <laughs> but we still have to tell React whether when we're using HTML, when we're using JavaScript uh, by use of the curly braces. So card subtitle, and then the last thing is card text. Card text. All right, and in there we just have post content. And that should be everything. That's all we need. So we're setting up our state variable to hold the information we're getting back from the database. Then we're actually doing the fetch to the database to go retrieve the information. And then we are displaying it in a nice, pretty big card. All right, I'll save that. Perfect. Now, last thing. Well, I guess there's two things left. We have our home page and then we have our nav bar. So those are the last two things we need to do. And even though there's lots of elements on the home page, so if we go look at the home page here, it's actually, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got a bunch of these cards here. There's actually not a whole lot going on. The nice thing about React is that it's sort of like EJS. So rather than hard coding the number of cards that we need, we just write the code for a single card and then React renders as many cards as it needs to at a given time. So if there's 60 things in the database, it's gonna render 60 cards. If there's one thing in the database, it's gonna render one card. If there's none, it'll render none. And so just like with EJS, it, you, you're bringing in that, that sort of loop functionality that you have in JavaScript to the visual display. So it's very nice. Uh, and so that's why we'll find that our homepage actually doesn't have a ton of stuff on it. It's really just defining everything for one card and then rendering it as many times as we need to. Now, it is time for a break. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take a break. Uh, I'm going to set this break for a little bit longer. I hope nobody minds too much. Uh, I need to go check on my foster kittens and make sure they're doing okay um, and uh, give them a little bit of a little bit of food. Um, they're, they're working on weaning onto uh, like, you know, actual canned food, but they're not quite there yet. So I need to give a few of them a little bit of formula um, and make sure that they got full tummies and uh, then, uh, then we'll come back and resume. Okay. But we're on the home stretch. Really all we have to do now is uh, code out our homepage and then code out our nav bar, and then we'll be done. All right, yes, <laughs> I can have some photos for you, absolutely. One kitten, please, yes. When, thank, for your patience, when I come back, um, I, will, I will show you some photos. All right, I am going to go ahead and set the timer for 20 minutes. I know that's kind of a long time, um, but uh, it could be that we resume sooner than that. I'll. I'll I'll let you guys know if I get back sooner and we're, we're ready to resume. Um, so my apologies, but I do have to do that um, to make sure that those kittens are feeling good. So I'm gonna set the timer here, 20 minutes. One kitten, please, Copper Lily. You can, you can, Copper Lily, you can redeem your channel points. Um, you can redeem your channel points and uh, Absolutely. You can name a kitten if you want. Yeah. 
I don't know why the timer looks weird. I hope you can see that okay. That's bizarre, but anywho. All right, see you back here in 20 minutes.
Hey there, folks. Uh, I just finished up feeding the kittens. So how about we give folks um, another, you know, two minutes to uh, come on back. I know folks are probably in the middle of doing other things, getting a snack. Um, so feel free to let me know if you need more time. Um, but we'll be ready to resume here in a couple minutes um, and finish out our app. So I'm going to get the photos pulled up so y'all can see the, what the kittens look like and decide if there might be one that you want to name. So I'll spend the next couple minutes doing that. We'll plan to resume when the timer hits um, three minutes, I suppose. Woohoo, kitten pics. Yes, absolutely. So you all deserve it um, for being so patient. So I will get those pulled up on my other screen here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the timer. Uh, we're at the three minute mark. Uh, I've got some photos to share with you. So let me get those um, pulled up on the screen. Just one second. I'm going to put up my re be right back screen for just a minute while I get the photos. Um, while I get the photos pulled up. Okay, so I have five foster kittens right now. This is when they were really little. So we're going to go kind of forward in time here. Um, this is when they were really, really teeny, teeny little. Uh, and as you can see, they eat formula and they're very cute. Yes, this is this one is very floofy. This one is a long haired kitty um, and she is adorable. Um, let's see if I can let's see. Let me scroll to the end here. Yep. Uh, this one's a little orange kitty. Yeah, cat book feed. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, this one's a little orange kitten. Um, and he is an absolute brick. Uh, like by that, I mean like he's huge. He's like dense, like a brick and he loves to eat. Um, yes. And he's got beautiful markings. You can't see them in this picture, but I have another picture later on. Hopefully you can see a little better. Um, that's a blurry one, but <laughs> she's very cute. Uh, this one's a little tabby. This one's a little black kitty and this uh, she's my little gremlin she's very she's got very sharp claws and she likes to use them she's a little gremlin that's another cute one the floofy one uh, and so here's kind of the group together you can see the markings a little bit better on the um uh, on the orange one there beautiful sort of a caramel um orange uh, with like swirls and it's just gorgeous yeah 
and you know they're starting to get to the age where they're able to play with each other a little bit and kind of you know they, my the, the, their favorite thing to do nice pudgy stomach on the gremlin yeah they're they're all nice and pudgy they're all they're all little pudgy bellies um that's the only way i can get pictures of them is after i feed them because they stop moving so much and so yeah um <laughs> But their favorite thing to do is to, the, especially the little one right here, this one, she likes to just roll on her back and just kind of like batter, batter paws around and it's so cute. She's like a little beach ball. Oh, that's a good picture of the orange baby. And the tabby. And the little gremlin. <laughs> really, I like that picture. She looks really mischievous there. And the floofy one. Another one of the floofy one. Funny one of the floofy one. Oh, and I love that one. That's my little. So this is, okay. So Tfizia. So if you want to name a kitten, this is the only one that I'm going to call dibs on. I've already named her. Um, so her name is Daisy. Uh, because she's got a little mark on her head that's like a big, like a, like a splotch, like a, a, a brown like a caramel drop, like a big, a big scoop of caramel on her head. And so I, I, I saw that as like a dollop. And so there's that old commercial a dollop of Daisy, like for the, for the sour cream. And so I, I've named her Daisy, but any of the other kittens you can name. Cause Daisy's my, Daisy's my little, my little kiddo. She's very cute. That's a, <laughs> that's my shopping list. This was just cute. I was trying to get a good picture. They were um they were lying on top of each other. So a little kitten sandwich. And then this is a little basket. Uh, these couple little baskets. Uh, I picked these up at a uh, like a thrift store. I don't even know what they're for. It's like two baskets that are like joined together. So two little little tiny. They're only like this big, like the size of your cupped hands. And they're, they're like hooked together in the middle. So I don't know what they're for. They can't even really stand up very well. But what they are good for is kittens, sitting sitting kittens inside of a basket. So I, they're, I, I think it must be made for, for little kittens. Yeah, obviously for kittens. Absolutely. Yeah. There's a little daisy in the basket. And the little orange baby. And that's, that's all the photos that I have so far, which is plenty, right? But uh, most of my photo storage, my Google photo storage is um, kitten photos. I got to say the majority. <laughs> I have so many. All right. Well, thank you all again. Winky boy. Yeah. It's my little brick. Um, so once again, thank you all for your patience. Uh, and uh but these are, this is, that's the reason, those five reasons are why uh, we had to take that 20 minute break there so I could make sure everybody got fed um, and was nice and full and happy. Yeah. All right. So let's get back to it, shall we? Come for the code, stay for the kittens. I, that's, that's the motto. That should be the motto of my stream. Come for the code, stay for the kittens. <laughs> All right. So let's get back to it. Um, so where we left off at the break was we had just finished building our post page and new post page. Now, uh, Archangel said, um, Mindwolf, you might have a bug in your app due to if an author or title is blank. Um, this will error the app due to undefined. Uh, you may want to use a nullish coalescing operator to prevent that, but you're called. Yes, so this app really doesn't have a lot of error handling at the moment. Uh, there's various ways that we could ensure that I, I, I would think that in a blog post, you would always want to make sure that the author that the title and the author are always populated, right? Those are kind of important for blog posts. Um, so I think what I might do instead, or I, I, I'm, I wanna finish the app first, um, but just as a kind of a to-do thing that we could do is um, in the form, we could do some validation up front, right? We could do some client side validation uh, in the form itself inside of our new post page here. So in the form, we could have, we could add the required property. Actually, let's just do it now. We'll add required. So I'm going to add the required property to all of these fields. And what this will do is it's going to prevent the form from being submitted without, um, without the, 
like the, those forms being, being filled in. It's going to, if somebody tries to submit it without those forms being filled in, um, they should get a little pop-up that says, Hey, this is required. You can't do that. Whatever. So, um, we can add that required property. And what we can also do, uh, is on the, so we can do some client side validation, right? But then if something were to get through, we could also have some server side validation. And so when we declare that MongoDB schema, um, which we did on the server side, we set up our MongoDB schema, the blueprint for how our app, um, how our data is going to be stored in the database. Um, you can also set all those fields to be required as well within the schema. So Mongoose won't let that data be written to the database unless it is complete. Um, so those are, those are just two ways we could mitigate that problem, um, one of which I've already just put in place here. Oh, and Archangel already did it in a PR. So they, 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 they fixed the, uh, they, they, they handled the, uh, the, the PR on GitHub. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's right, they are. <laughs> yes, thank you, Archangel. So yes, two, two ways just off the top of my head that we can make sure that the correct data gets entered all the time. Required field number one and um, schema validation number two. And if you can validate in multiple places, such as on the client side and on the server side, then you can pretty much ensure that you're going to have good data um, written to your database and read by your app every single time. <laughs> Thank you for that, Archangel. I appreciate that. That's a good, uh, good mindset to have. We gotta, we, we gotta enable the future, right? More people need to get into the industry. It's not, it's not, it's not slowing down. That's for sure. All right. So we have homepage. Uh, so we have post page, which is done. We have new post page, which I did remember to export at this time. So the last element here is homepage. Then we'll go to our nav bar. Then we'll be done. Archangel says, my principle is always be able to sell your API and your front end separately. So no hard dependency on one another. Yeah, sure. You split them out and then you could, you could build out an API that could potentially be accessible by multiple apps. So you could have an API structured in such a way that it could be like the hub for multiple apps, just using the API in different ways. Right. And so I think that's, yeah, that's a great thing to do. All right. In our home page, it's going to be very similar in the basic setup to how we've been doing this stuff so far. So we're going to have some similar import statements. I think we can grab pretty much everything from probably I'm going to grab all my imports from uh, post page. So I'm just grabbing all these imports here and I'm going to drop them into home page like this. And so once again, we're going to need react, uh, use effect and use state just like before. We're going to have Axios. Um, we're going to have React Bootstrap. We're going to have a few more things here. So we need card, button, um, container, row, and column. And this is all, again, just for styling. Card, button, container, row, column. Um, and we're also going to have, instead of use params from react router we're going to have link instead so use effect use state axios link and all these styling elements from react bootstrap so just like all the other times before we can declare our component as an arrow function oops sorry brackets there we go And we're also going to need a piece of state here. Um, this piece of state is not just going to contain a single post. It needs to contain all of the posts that we potentially want to display on the home page. And this number of posts could change, right? Let's say I am on the home page and I delete a post. So right now, all three of these posts here on the home page, these are stored in state. And as soon as I click delete, this post is going to be removed from the database and it's going to be removed from our state. And that state change, when that number of posts in state decreases, decreases by one, that's going to trigger 
the display to change and this card to disappear. So I don't know, it's probably too quick to see, but you may have noticed that that whole page didn't refresh. As soon as I click delete, the whole page didn't reload. And that's how we're used to apps working, right? We're used to, you click a button and then the whole page reloads. And it's not a huge deal when it's a small app, right? Like, like this, a lightweight little app with not a lot going on. But if you have a big honking page with a bunch of forms and buttons and images and text, if you have to reload that whole page every single time something changes on the page, that's going to suck. It's going to suck for the user's internet connection. It's going to st suck for their experience because they're going to lose track of where they are. Um, and so the beauty of React is that it only changes what needs to change when it needs to change. So what needed to change? This card needed to go away. So React only removed the card and left everything else alone. So as Archangel says, it's reactive, AKA React. Yep, it's named React for a reason. It reacts to changes when they occur. And how we control that reaction is via state. So state is what's controlling the state of our app. So in this case, my piece of state is gonna be posts because it's holding all the posts. And my uh, set function is gonna be set posts, which is the standard naming convention. And we set the default value for this piece of state, which is going to be a, an empty array. An empty array. Uh, Dev Philipper said, is that thanks to state? So it doesn't make a new call to the API? Basically, yeah. So we're gonna be, we're using a combination of use effect and use state here. Um, use effect is gonna make the call to the API when the page loads. So when the page when the page loads once, it's going to go out and fetch all the posts, right? As soon as the page loads, it needs to fetch all the posts so it can display them on the screen. Um, but after that, it's going to store all that data in state, right? It's going to store all that data in state so we have it. And so as soon as that card is deleted, it's going to update state, remove the card, and it is going to make another call to the API but that call is gonna to be to delete, to delete that object from the database. So the database and our state are gonna be in sync there. Yeah, as, as Archangel says, a delete request is gonna be made, but not, it doesn't need to go out and you know, reload the page and fetch everything again and re-render everything like a regular app would, like a, like a regular JavaScript, HTML, CSS app would. They would, because it would have to make a whole fresh fetch. It would have to loop through the entire array again, see how many elements there are um, and, you know, render everything again. Yeah. So hopefully that makes sense, but it's one of the, it's just a, you know, it's a resource saver there, right? So we're setting up our empty state. We're going to use this as an empty array because it could be that there's nothing in the database. Like when you first initialize your app for the first time, you're not going to have anything in there. So it should start out empty, but as soon as that fetch is made, we're going to populate it with everything in uh, that collection. So once again, use effect to do our initial get request out to the API. And actually, I could probably copy this from uh, our post page. So I'm just going to copy this whole um, use effect here. We're going to modify it a little bit, but I'm just I just copy that from post page. So fetch posts is what we're going to call this, and we're going to do a fetch request out to um, out to our uh, out to our API but we're gonna visit this time instead of visiting the specific ID instead of requesting one ID we're just gonna get everything and we have a path for that we've already set it up on our controller on our server side so we're gonna get retrieve all the posts this time everything and so we're gonna take that information we're gonna set it into our state variable. And then we're immediately going to call this function. So as soon as the page renders, use effect is going to activate. It's going to call fetch posts, make the call of the API, populate our state, and then that's what's going to be looped through to generate the cards. Okay. Uh, Search says, is there going to be a video of this stream here on Twitch or YouTube? Got to go. Oh, both places. It's going to be both here on Twitch for 60 days. And before that, before it expires, before it goes away, it's going to move to my YouTube channel. 
uh, exclamation point YouTube if you want to link to my YouTube channel. Um, that's where all all of my past streams, uh, as long as I've been on Twitch, that's where they all end up. So you can go back through over a year of streams uh, and see all my content there. Yeah, there you go. All right, so we've set our state and we've set our use effect so we can retrieve that. And now the last thing I want to do here is just remove this ID value. Um, because essentially what we want to happen here is um, we only want this use effect to make one single git call to the API, retrieve everything, and then if we delete something, it's going to go away from state and that will then just delete the card. So we don't need to make another fetch out to the API at, at any point. We're, we're done there. No worries. Thank you, Search. Thanks for coming. OK, now the next function that we need to do here is we need to make sure we can handle deletes. So as we just discussed, we only want to make one fetch call to the API. But if there is a delete, we need to make sure that we can handle that and, and tell the server to go remove that item from the database. So handle delete. This is going to be an async because we're going to be talking to our API. And we want to pass in the ID value of the post that we are trying to delete. Um, now in here, I did remember to do a try catch block. So I did. So if you want to see a try catch block, I actually did it here. Go me. Try catch blocks though are pretty simple to implement. All you need to do is just say try, and this is where you're going to put the thing you're going to try to do, and then catch for any errors that are returned. And in here is where you put what you want to happen with those errors. Uh, Jay Herman says it's re-render on every ID change. Um, what, sorry, which element are you talking about? Because the the homepage is only is the homepage is only going to do one fetch. It's going to get everything, and then as soon as we delete something, it's only going to it's only going to re-render the the card. It's going to remove only the card that we deleted. So when we delete something, we want to make a call out to the API. And we already have a path for that. It's set to a delete. So out in our API, we're listening for a delete path or a delete method. And we simply pass in the, the, the path. So I'm going to copy it from up here, pass in the path, and then the ID of the post that we want to delete. So I can use my little. Oh, I need to have this in, uh... oh, no, that's fine. We're good. I have it in ticks already. All right. So I can pass it in as a template literal, just like this. Pass that in. Pass it in as the path. And our server is listening for that and can pass that into a controller, which will actually delete the item from the database. Yeah, absolutely. OK, yeah, I think I understand the question now. Thank you, Archangel. So here. Use effect is only going to run once when the page renders. It's going to capture all the data from the database and put it in state. It's going to put it in this state variable right here. However, yes, you notice the difference that the way we used use effect here, this um, dependency, this is called dependencies, this dependency uh, part is empty because we only want it to run once, get everything, and then you know not keep making fetch calls to the API. Uh, however, on post page, we did have a dependency. And that dependency was if the ID changes, if for some reason we wanted to display a different post ID, then it should go and do another fetch and get that new post, get that different post. So we're always displaying the correct post on the post page. So yes, that's the difference. One of them has a dependency that may cause it to fire again and do another fetch. Um, this one does not. I hope that helps a little bit. All right, so down here in our deletes, first thing we want to do is await this deletion from the database. And then after that, we're going to update our state. So we're going to remove, so, so we need to do two things here. We're removing it from the database, from database. And the second thing we're going to do 
is remove the item from our local state. So we're going to say filter. We're going to take that, that, that array that's already in there. And we're going to find the matching post ID and just filter it out. That's all we have to do. It's just an array method. It's nothing crazy. Once I'm done here, I'll we'll walk through it. OK, so here, all we're doing is we're looking inside of this array, which contains all the posts that we got back from the database. And we are saying, OK, I want to update my state. I'm going to take that array. I'm going to filter it. I'm going to take the ID that we've passed in here and look inside of that array for any matching ID. So any, if I find a match, I'm going to filter it out. So remove item from database and remove item from state. There we go. Dev Philipper says, so if you wanted the home page to automatically reload if others made new blog posts, you could add ID into that dependency. Um, yeah, you may have to have like, um, I'm thinking about that. I'm not sure, quite sure what the dependency would be, but yeah, you would need that. You would need use effect to, to fire the fetch again. Um, so you would, but yeah, you would need some kind of a trigger to make this fire again, but I, I don't think ID would be the right choice. Um, because the, the ID is coming from like the, the, the URL path, it's being it's pulled from the parameters in the path itself. And so you wouldn't have that to, to, to pull in here. So I'm not quite sure what the right answer would be, but you would need something to make this, oops, you would need something to make this fire again if you, know, if you wanted it to update in real time as other users added things. Okay, so uh, we've removed the item from the database. We've mo removed the item from our state. Um, and if there is an error, we can console log it. So we can just say console.error and then And then say error deleting post and show the error. Yeah. All right, I think that's all the logic that we need. So now what we can do is Archangel says an ID would not be able to be called unless it's passed down as a prop, but that is a whole other ballgame. Absolutely. Yeah, we're not really doing much with props here. Um, I don't, I just didn't want, I wanted to make it functional, but not too complex. And so, yeah, absolutely. You'd have, you, you would probably have to do something with passing props, um, listening for, like, you probably have to have a global state or of some kind, which would be, you know, triggering a fetch when the, uh, when somebody submits a new post, grabbing it, everything down from the API, updating a global state, and then passing that state down. Um, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. Let's follow the KISS principle. Absolutely. Yep. But could it be done? Absolutely. Yes, you would just need to restructure things a little bit, probably. All right, so once again, we're gonna have a nice container here. I do like my containers and my cards. I'm a, like I say, I'm a simple woman, simple styles. Um, now, what we're gonna do here in order to properly arrange our cards on the page, I know the styling isn't great, but um, we're gonna have, we're gonna set things out in a grid pattern. Uh, using rows and columns, which we imported from React Bootstrap. Um, you saw me do that import there. So we have these row and column properties that we can use. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to have a row. And inside of that row, hey, Madeline, <laughs> how are you? I forgot to send you that video. Gosh dang it. I have a, I have a video of Madeline the kitten. Um, Madeline uh, named a kitten a while back, and uh, so I, I took a video, and I, I keep forgetting to send it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I have five new kittens now, so you missed those. You, you didn't get here in time to see those kittens, but you can check the VOD um, after the last break. We I did a little kitten kitten photo slideshow of my five new kittens. So, All right, so inside of this row, what I essentially want to do is I want to take the... Um, the post data that I that I've got back from my database, I pulled down all the posts in that Axios request, and um, 
what I want to do is essentially just loop through them. We're just going to do a loop. And for each one, we're going to render a card. It's that simple. Um, now, if I have um, a big old honking array of posts, um, what is the best way for me to loop through that array and I guess produce something different? What, what, what would you think the best way for, the, for, for me to do that would be? <laughs> Lemon is your quick. Yeah, we're going to use map. We're going to map. We're going we're gonna to map through this array and we're going to render out a card for each element. So posts, this is my post array here, and we're going to map. And for each post, so for each post, we're going to do a thing. So that's what map is kind of for. Oops. All right, there we go. All right, so inside of map, we're literally just going to render out a card. Um, so I'm going to call my call here. And four. This is basically just saying um, how many items do we want on each um, on each one. So that's the count there. Class name. Uh, we're going to have a margin bottom of four. And then we're going to have a key. Does anybody know why we need this? My key is going to be post ID, so that unique ID value. What is this? What is this? Does anybody know? So each column is going to have four items. Uh, it's going to have a margin of four, margin bottom of four, and a key of post ID. It's okay if you don't know. No clue. Okay, that's all right. We'll talk about it in a second. I can't, uh, I can't talk and do styling at the same time. So width is going to be 18 rem. Oops. All right. So inside of my card, just like we did for the, um, just like we did for the post page, we're going to have a lot of those similar elements. So I'm going to grab some of those elements from the card down here. So uh, we're going to have a card image, card body, card title, tar card text. Yeah, so I'm going to grab a few of these elements here. I'm going to grab the image. Drop that there. We don't need this class name here. Variant is going to be top. Uh, source is going to be post image. Alt is going to be post title. And then below that, We'll have our card body. And inside there, we can have our card title and our card text. So I'm going to copy all these three, get rid of the subtitle, although we can keep that. It doesn't really matter. And card text. <laughs> uh, yes, and as far as keys go, um, exactly right. That's a great summary, Copper Lily. Uh, keys are how React keeps track of list items. Um, so let's think about it. Let's say I had four cards in a row. And I delete the second card in that row. Now I have three cards remaining. The first card is still in the same position, but the third and fourth cards are now the second and third, right? Because card number two is gone. So if you were thinking about it in terms of an array, those items, th those items three and four, which are now two and three, those have changed because they're in a different position, but have they really, right? Their, their content hasn't changed at all. They don't need to be re-rendered because they're, they're, all, that's, all that's happened is one item has been removed. 
So their content is still fine. We don't need to do anything with that. They, they don't need to be re-rendered. Um, and so that's why we have keys instead of using something like an array identifier, instead of using something like position in the array, because what this key is gonna do is be like, yeah, actually this content hasn't changed in cards three and four, they've just shifted position. So we don't need to re-render the card itself. Um, all we need to do is just make sure that that second card is removed. So instead of using array positions, we always want to have some kind of a unique identifier to tell React when or when it when it does need to re-render something versus when it doesn't need to re-render something. Um, keys can are generally used with database IDs. Um, you could also generate unique IDs on the fly. What you really don't want to use is array identifiers. So like their their position in the array. Um, just for the reasons that I stated, right? Um, you want React to be able to keep track of which items are where. And if you start using array positions and you start shifting things, pushing, popping, moving things around in an array, um, then React isn't gonna, isn't gonna know what to render and what not to render. So it's probably just gonna render everything. Oh, thank you for the hydrate. Hmm. Dev says, is it tricky to make this responsive? moving from four columns to two to one. No, so you can actually have, um, you can set display size. So Bootstrap has built-in like display sizing. So like media queries. Um, and so you can set like how many columns you want it to display for large, medium, small, extra small. Uh, and it just has those built by default. I didn't do this. I didn't make this responsive. <laughs> I probably should have, um, but I didn't. Uh, but we did do that for the, um, we did do that for the, cat book, I believe. I believe we did make that responsive. So if you want to see an example, look at the homepage on that one um, or, and, and or the kitten store apps. Um, then you can see uh, how to use those built-in display sizes to do your media queries for you and control how many columns are displayed uh, based on screen size. Uh, Black Swordsman asks, is this Chakra? Now this is React and Bootstrap. Yep. All right, so we have our keys, we have our card, post title, post content. Um, oh, sorry, this should be post author. I apologize. Author, there we go. Uh, and then the next thing we want is we want a link to the read more button, which will bring up the post page, right? And then we want to, so we're going to have two buttons here, one for read more, one for delete. All right, so now since this is a route, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a button, but we're gonna wrap it in a link. So it's kind of like we're wrapping a button in an anchor tag um, in order to turn it into something that, will, that, that can transport the user to another location. So I'm gonna first use a link tag and I'm gonna put the place where I want, the, the, where, the path where I want the user to go. So in this case, it's gonna be link to and my path is just going to be the, the path to display the post page, which is posts. And then we're going to pass the post ID. So post um, dot underscore ID. All right, let's see. And then I can close that. So now whatever happens inside of this link tag, what, however the user interacts with it, it's going to take them to the path specified. So all I'm gonna put in here is just a button. They click the button, they go to the link. So my button here is just gonna be a variant of primary. It's gonna have a class name of margin right two, and that button text is just gonna be read more. So we've wrapped our button in a link, and then we're going to do um, for the delete button, we're going to do it slightly differently. We don't need to take the user anywhere. When they click delete, we want to leave them on the home page. We just want to trigger all the things we said should happen when they click delete. So it should, um, it should send that delete request out to our API and it should remove that post from state and it should remove the card, which, which it will do because we've changed state. 
is linked from React Router DOM. Um, yes, it is. So we've imported it up here from React Router DOM. And what that's doing is it's helping us interface with that router that we built way back at the beginning and route traffic where it needs to go, right? So route the user where they need to go. So this button is just going to be a button. Now, oh, come on. Button, and it's going to be our delete button. And we're just going to give it the variant of danger. So it's red. And then we're going to, on when they click it, we want to immediately start that delete. So I'm actually going to use an event handler here, on click. On click, when this button is clicked, listen for a click, and then simply call that handle delete function. Handle delete, we're going to pass in the post ID post ID and then do 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 the delete so on click call handle delete passing the post ID handle delete gets called it deletes the item from the database it filters it out of state and then when state changes the appropriate elements on the page will also change so that's what state is for right it, it, it it triggers the reactivity of the app and determine what needs to change. So that card will be removed automatically because this, because that, that item is no longer in state. Uh, Swordsman says, is Axios important to use or just fetch? Is it no? Most of the time, fetch is fine. Um, you can read up about the differences between fetch and Axios. Um, Axios is better at backwards compatibility, but that's becoming less and less important as people move off of, you know, Windows XP and uh, Internet Explorer 11 or whatever. No, it's okay, Black Sports. I mean, that's a perfectly fine question. Um, there are some other functional differences between the two. Really, I'm just using Axios here because we can. Um, it's important to be familiar with and comfortable with various tools because you'll probably see Axios a lot, like out in the wild. A lot of people do use it. Um, but I mean, for the most part, Fetch is going to do what you need to do, especially for simple stuff like this. OK, I think that's everything we need here. We've got our button, card, body, card, column. I've got all my close friends, row container. And then I just need to do my export. Aren't you proud of me? I remembered. Yeah, there's no such thing as a, as a stupid question or a simple question. Or nothing, you, nothing, nobody has to apologize. It's all good. As long as it's, you know, roughly on topic and you're not being rude, I don't care what you ask. <laughs> and I don't often get, I don't often get rude people in my chat. Y'all are pretty wholesome. I gotta say. No worries, Archangel. Thank you for, thank you for all your help today. You've been so helpful. Um, I really appreciate it. It's good to, good to have you here today. All right, so we've exported that. Now we're almost done. Home stretch, baby. Last thing we need is our nav bar. Now our nav bar is not a page in itself. Um, our nav bar is what we call just a component. It's a part of a page, right? Um, it's not a full page. It's just a tiny part. And we can reference it wherever we need it, as many times as we need it. And uh, so we're going to put that in our components folder, like we did here. Uh, our digital says, Switch to Vite over Webpack, yes. Like I said, we have used Vite several times here on stream. I do like it a lot. Um, yeah, they, they're, yeah, it, Vite is great. It is. We'll probably use that the next time we build something in React. Oh, thank you, Archangel. They say their DMs are open uh, for those who have questions. Thank you so much. All right, now the nav bar is really just going to be this. The name these couple of links, and then some basic functionality for, um, so if I was on this page and I went on mobile, so you can see how we've got this little hamburger menu here. That's really all this is going to be. So that responsiveness to being on mobile, the, the two links and the uh, blog name. Now, the cool thing is, is that that hamburger menu, slidey drawer box thing, that's built in to React Bootstrap. So that's not something we have to code or animate or figure out how it works. 
Um, yeah, you can post your Discord username. That's fine. Um, so we don't have to figure out how that works because it's actually built in and we can just reference it. Yeah, <laughs> I would, yes, I would suggest when you're building, when you're, when you're modifying this and building this out, yes, do put some, uh, put a, put a little padding on top of these cards. Cause yes, that's a styling mistake on my part. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to need to import just a couple things here. So I, from hope from one of these, I'll just grab, um, let's see, I'm going to grab here. Uh, it's all right. I'll just do the imports. I don't really have a good thing to copy and paste. So I'm just going to do import react from react. And we're going to import a couple of custom nav bar components from react bootstrap. So nav bar and nav from react bootstrap. Here we go. And then finally import link container from react router bootstrap and so that's basically going to allow bootstrap to talk to our router um, and handle links properly all right bye archangel <laughs> so our navbar component Declared just like all the other components with an arrow function. And for this one, we don't really need any logic um, because all of our routing and stuff is going to be handled by those built in um, nav bar and link components. So we don't need to build any custom logic. We're going to use everything that's, that we've just imported up here. This will do everything we need to do. So we don't need any logic. We're just going to go straight to the return statement like so. And we're going to use the nav bar tag. And we can do a little styling here. Background is going to be uh, dark. Holla, holla, dim boys just follow. <laughs> Thank you, holla, holla. I appreciate the follow. Um, background is going to be dark. Variant is also going to be dark. And then expand. So this is going to, so this expand tag right here, this is going to, going to control, help us control whether, um, whether or not you see the hamburger menu. So basically when should the nav bar expand? Um, when should it be condensed? And then class name is going to be PX3. I'm sorry. I think there's a bug on my leg. All right, there we go. I forget what this one does. I forget what PX3 means. So, okay, now we can set up our links. So our links are gonna interface with our router to route traffic to the home page, the new post page, wherever it needs to go. So link container. Padding X axis, okay. Thank you, Laminus. I couldn't remember what that was for. <laughs> so our first link is going to be just to the home page. So all we need to do there is just say to link. So link to home. And we can make our, this is, this is how we can make our logo take us to the home page. So if somebody clicks on the home page, um, we can have bar brand my blog. So this right here, is now a link to the home page. So you can click on the logo and go to the home page. And now we're going to have the elements of the nav bar that will expand or collapse based on screen size. So nav bar, it's really simple to do this and it's really kind of cool. So nav bar dot toggle. And we can set some controls here for accessibility. I just copied and pasted this from somewhere. But ARIA is good. I mean, it's good to have accessibility, so I'm going to leave it in. When you see references to ARIA, that refers to accessibility tools. For those who may be using screen readers or um, other, you know, helpful 
navigation tools if they can't use a web page in the way that um, a normally uh, sighted person uh, would use it. So navbar collapse is basically going to be the tag that we're going to wrap all of our links in. So these are the things that are going to be hidden if we have a hamburger menu. So the things that will not display if the screen is small and we have a hamburger menu. Basic navbar nav. Uh, Orestes says, question, I'm building a React project with Vite and my files are JSX instead of JS. Is there any major difference? Yeah, so uh, essentially we are writing in JSX here. What I'm writing right now, this is JSX. Um, but you can still label them as JS files. I just tend to do it out of habit. Um, oh, navbar collapse. No, this is correct. Uh, so uh, this is wrong though. So I need to make sure I get this right. Yeah, I've been, I've been capitalizing that wrong. I apologize. So navbar should be a lowercase b. So navbar, link container, navbar. Yeah, I got to fix these. Good catch. Good job. Navbar toggle, navbar collapse. And I'll change my closing tag there too. Okay, that should be right. Thank you for that. So inside of our, um, the collapsible part of our navbar, we can put our actual links. So class name is going to be ML auto. And this is essentially just going to align all of our links as far to the left as they can go. And then we can have two link containers. Oops. And these are going to go to the home page first and the new post page. Create post. And this one is going to go to our post new path, which will pass through our router and it will render the new post page. All right, now let me double check my capitalization here. That should be all we need to do. Really all we're doing is we are creating the ability for the hamburger menu to collapse or expand based on screen size. That's, it was just this easy to do. We basically just said, hey, if the screen is large, expand the full nav bar. And we've got our toggle, which is our hamburger menu. Um, and we've got the section of the nav bar that we want to collapse if the screen is um, small. And that contains our link to our homepage and our um, create post page. Paula says, do you only code on the weekend slash Sunday? I only stream on Sunday. Um, I, my day job is I'm a SQL developer. So my day job is five days a week I work with databases. And then on Sundays, I come here and I do whatever the heck I want. We're building apps, we're building React, we're building JavaScript, web dev, whatever. Yeah. Oh yeah, I only stream on Sundays. Um, once the new uh, once the new 100 devs cohort starts back up, which is the, a big uh, free web dev um, class, uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a volunteer kind of helper educator with that class. So I'll start streaming twice a week once the new cohort starts, but we're in the off season. So I'm only, um, if you want to learn more about 100 devs, yeah, we can do uh, exclamation point Leon in the chat. There you go. Um, check out the Discord. It's huge, 30,000 people or so. Um, and yeah, so once that new class starts up, I will be streaming twice a week once again. Um, but in the off season, only once a week. All right, so I think we should be done. Now it looks like it's compiling successfully. So let's go ahead and YOLO it. Let's see what we got here. So this is the old, this is the one that's already the, the, the working one, the finished version. So we want to find, where's my new version here? Let's see, is it this one? I forget which one. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna restart it because I don't remember which one is which. <laughs> so I'm gonna kill it and do npm start again. Now it's more than likely that there's some kind of mistake, but we'll figure it out. Yes, I would like to run another port. All right, it did compile, but 
Oh, thank you, Hala Hala. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally understand. There's time differences and things. Absolutely. Um, so if you want to check out my archive, if you don't, if you, I know you can't always watch me live, and that's perfectly fine. Um, check out my archive on YouTube. All my videos are ad free. Um, so exclamation point YouTube. If you want to link to my YouTube channel, it's where my entire archive is. So enjoy. Oh, thank you, Deb. All right. So looks like we're not quite rendering yet. That's all right. We'll figure it out. <laughs> thank you. <Hala. laughs> oh, I didn't export my nav bar. Gosh, dang it. <laughs> I'm going to need to set up like a channel point reward that y'all can trigger when I forget an export because it's happened many times. I simply cannot seem to remember to do it. So export default, whoops, defaults nav bar. There we go. All right, let me double check. Let's see, nav bar, let's see. I'm surprised it didn't. Give me an error when I, uh... all right, saved. Okay, compiled. Yeah, and you may, if you're running uh, Create React app, you may get this kind of yellow text here that says, one of your dependencies, Babel is blah, 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 blah all this stuff. That's not going to hurt anything. It's still going to work. Um, it's just a warning. So don't freak out about that. I've had some folks be like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Okay, now there we go. Nav bar is working. Yes. Baller. Okay. So that's what was missing before. That's why. So there's nothing in this collection right now. There's nothing in my database. So there's nothing to display on the home page. If you want, you could have a message that pops up that says, Hey, no posts to display. Um, but we just we have nothing. So now the nav bar is working and we can navigate. Um, yes. And, uh, as PyPro mentions, if you're building a react component, there's an extension you can install in VS Code, and I forget what it is. Somebody knows, some, one of y'all knows out there. What is that extension you can install for React snippets? Um, when you do that, you can have a, um, you can just use a keyboard, a, a quick shortcut, like uh, like they said, RFC or RFC. Um, you can type in a series of letters, and that'll automatically generate a React component for you. Um, I've been doing it by hand because it's, it, it helps me roll more slowly and I can explain what's happening while I do it. Um, but yes, there's some great extensions out there for helping you generate quick components on the fly. All right, so let's see if we can um, create a, oh, I forgot, looks like I forgot a label there. So that's slightly wrong. <laughs> that looks a little wonky. Well, let's fix that real quick. That's just, that's a styling thing. That's nothing that, you know, that's, that's just styling. So I want to correct that real quick on my create post. What did I do there? Uh, ba -ba -ba. I think I just have one too many. No worries, Pipro. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. Let's see. I think I need to, I'm going to add some spacing here so I can see better. Form group. Uh, oh, yeah, I really screwed that. Let's see. Form group form group. Oh, and I didn't um, form group. There we go. I forgot my label. Yeah, so I need content here. That should help. So form group and then form control. All right, let's see how that looks. Okay, the label's there now, but I still have an extra, um, I have an extra box. So almost got it. Text area. Let me know if you all spot the problem, why that's displaying weird. Type text area rows. Line 48. Form control. Oh, yep, you're right. You nailed it. I have an that's where the extra this. Yep, exactly. You got it. Good job. Good job, Deb. So yes, the reason why that was, yep, the reason why that was airing out, and good job everybody else who spotted it too. Um, this is a single, like a 
a single tag. So it doesn't have an open and close. It's just a single tag, sort of like an image tag. Um, and so I had an extra one there because I guess I just copied and pasted wrong. Um, and so that's why I put an extra box there. So once I do that, I should just be able to go here, refresh. And oh yeah, I didn't even need to refresh. It's all, it's all fixed now. So also that I was expecting that to be a text area box, but that's all right. We'll just roll with it. Um, I'm going to generate some, let's see, do a test post one author is me, uh, image URL. Uh, so how you can get some quick test images and placeholder images. Um, one good site is placehold.co and I'll put that in chat. So this is a good place where you can generate really any kind of custom sized images. Uh, if you want to test images of a certain size in your app, um, certain colors, formats, that kind of thing. You can even do um, fonts. You can generate fonts. You can do things for retina displays. You can even generate videos. I haven't tried this one yet, but apparently it'll give you placeholder videos, um, which is pretty cool. Just to it really just to make sure that your app is working properly. Um, and there's things like Place Kitten and, and other sites like that, but this one is good for just really generic, basic, customizable testing. <laughs> As Drunk Over Grandma says, how dare you not use Place Kitten for images? <laughs> uh, Orestes says, uh, the difference between React Bootstrap and Bootstrap is basically using the name of classes, but using them as tags. There, so React Bootstrap does add additional functionality. Um, the, the React Bootstrap is specifically made to work directly with React, uh, and so it can do a little bit more than just regular Bootstrap. You can use regular Bootstrap with React, though. So I'm just going to copy the basic placeholder image. Um, not going to modify it at all. I'll just drop that in there. And then for content, I'm going to use another placeholder generator, which is Lorem Ipsum. Uh, so you may not be familiar with Lorem Ipsum, but it's essentially filler text. Uh, and it's a very specific type of filler text. Uh, and it's all in Latin, so it doesn't mean anything. So you're not going to, you know, put incorrect information out there. You're not going to offend anyone or anything like that. It's just filler Latin text. Uh, and it's very commonly used as test text. And so if you ever see this in a on a website or in a test build or in a deployment that's about to go to production and, and go out in front of users, if you ever see stuff like this, you immediately know that there's some content that's missing. That so that's a uh, that's why this stuff is used all the time because you can look at it and you can immediately say, okay, wait, somebody forgot to put in the real content. So I'm going to use this. I'm just going to grab a couple paragraphs. Zay, thank you for the follow. Zay underscore CS just followed. Here we go. Oh, thank you, Lemonus. Hey, uh, Zay. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lemonus. I appreciate it. It's good to have you here. Uh, so I've dropped that in there. And the site I'm using, if you want to use it for yourself, uh, is just lauramipsum.io, but there's a bunch of different sites out there that can generate it for you. So there you go. How's it going? It's going real good. Zape, we are just we just finished building an app, a React app, um, using React and uh, Mongoose and MongoDB, and we built our a we built an API first, and then we built a separate client side React application to hit that API and write to the database. So we're just in the testing phase now, trying to see if it's going to work or not. All right, so let's create. Hey, it worked, baby. All right, let's look at read more. Hey, <laughs> it worked. Check it out. So we got our image. We've got our title. We've got our byline. We've got our content, baby. Yeah. All right, now let's double check. Make sure that everything wrote to the database. So we're going to go into our MongoDB database. And <laughs> clap. <laughs> so I'm, I'm writing to React Blog 2 in this version of the app. I'm going to go into my post collection. And yeah, check it out. All the content is there inside of our MongoDB database. So I think we're cooking, folks. I think we are cooking. All right, I'm going to add one more, and then I'm going to do a delete. 
So test post two, uh, author is me again. Uh, image URL, we'll just grab another placeholder image. Uh, color, we'll do, I'll grab it. I'm gonna grab a different colored image just to differentiate a little better. There we go. Uh, and then content, I'll grab some more lorem ipsum. I do wanna fix that test, text box, but that's not vital. It's all right. What's more important is the functionality. Hey, there we go. Yay. Uh, Dev Philipper said, is the content formatting lost when you push it to MongoDB? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I wonder if that's coming from Lorem Ipsum, if it's removing the paragraph line breaks, or if that's coming from MongoDB. I don't know. Um, let's see. I'm going to do, I said I was going to do a delete, so I'm going to delete the first one. Oh, first off, click, click there. Okay, that works. Now I'm going to delete number one. Hey, it worked. So let's check the database. And now instead of test post one, we should see test post two as the only item. So I'm going to refresh. Yeah, there we go. Test post two is the only item now. <laughs> Goal, indeed. Yeah, that worked uh, surprisingly well. Um, okay, I do want, the last thing I want to do here is I do want to see if I can fix this text box. This should be a text area box and not, um, let me make sure it's like that in the finished version. Oops, too close. Okay, so it's that's correct in the finished version. I just must have made a mistake somewhere. So let's fix that real quick. All right, text area, format control. Oh, okay, I got it. I figured it out. So form control is, instead of the type keyword, we need to use the as keyword. So form control as text area. So by default, these form controls are gonna be um, of the standard like little bar type. And so if you want this different type where we want it as a text area, we just need to, to, to change it that way. So as text area, that should, that should fix it. Hey, Moptics. Okay, let's see. Yes, this is the new version. So, yep, now that's working just fine. Uh, the nice thing about these text area boxes is that you can, you know, you can make them even bigger if you wanted. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna do one more test of the, I'm gonna grab Lorem Ipsum again here and see if it's preserving paragraph breaks I'm just curious. Doesn't matter all that much, but okay. So it does. So uh, I think um, what Dev what Dev Philipper asked there is is content formatting lost when you push it to MongoDB? I, I guess it looks that way. Um, I would think if you maybe that you have to add in some like some break tags, you know. If there's a paragraph break, it, may, it might need to read that in and add in a break tag, save that in the database, and then when you retrieve it from the database, just render that break tag um, in between the paragraphs. I don't know the best way to do that, actually. Alrighty. So, very cool. Looks like we are working. Um, you know, obviously there's some things that could be better, right? We need to add more try catch blocks. Um, this formatting looks wonky. Um, you know, th this is this is a very basic template, but the goal here is to give you all something to build off of. So you can you can do this now. You can, you have an API. The API is running. Uh, we built that first. It's in a you know it's in a separate repo. It's cooking. It's got almost all the CRUD operations: create, read, and delete. Uh, there's no update, but you could add that if you wanted. You have the, the structure, you have the scaffold now um, to make this into whatever the heck you want. It doesn't have to be a blog app. Um, it could be a shopping app. It could be um, like a social media app, right? It could be like a Pinterest Instagram app. It could be a recipe app where people post photos. Uh, this might be a fun recipe app. People could post photos of their stuff and then you could click in here and you could show the recipe. 
Uh, Lemony says, when you deploy something like this, uh, would you deploy the back end and front end to something like Vercel? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of different options out there. You would have to deploy the back end, you know, both the back end and the front end, and make sure that your um, that your front end client is is uh, directing all the calls to wherever you deployed it, right? So your your URL wouldn't be localhost anymore; it would be, you know, Vercel app or whatever wherever you put it. I know there's certain um, there's certain hosts that are better for APIs, um, but you'd have to just do a little research and see which one is the most economical and the best for your deployment. But yeah, you'd have to deploy them both um, and then have your, your front end hit uh, your API wherever you deployed it. And you could add, uh, you'd also, you know, if you wanted to make this into a recipe app, I'm actually kind of liking this idea. If you wanted to make this into a recipe app, you could add authentication, have people log in. Um, you could add a favoriting system to have them click, you know, click a star if they like something. And then you could save those, their liked recipes um, in a collection in the database, right? And you would tie that collection to the user or tie that, sorry, tie uh, all those favorited items to whatever user favored them. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of potential here for this, I think. All right. Any other questions? Uh, once again, you can access the repo with the finished code. If you just joined us and you're like, Hey, this might be something fun. I could do something with, um, the links to the repos I've just posted in chat for you. Uh, the first one is the API, the backend. Um, and the next one is the front end. Um, it's very simple, very lightweight on purpose. Uh, so that's easy to understand and easy for you to pick up and modify and add features to it. All right. Any questions? No worries, Dev developer. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. It's fun for me. I hope you all had fun as well. Yeah, no worries, Luminous. All right, anybody have any questions for me in general? Um, questions about 100 devs, questions about who I am, what I do. Um, I got Lily says, it's been so long since I've done a crud app from scratch. Yay, that's awesome. <laughs> Joy Coco Grandma says, hand out API keys like NASA Gmail from the cohort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of those APIs are built to handle lots of traffic. Some of them are not. And there's tons of cool APIs out there. If you don't want to build your own API, if you just want to build an app to hit an existing API, there's so many cool ones out there uh, to do pretty much whatever the heck you want to do. Um, you know, there's the NASA API, there's tons of recipe APIs, there's APIs for every possible topic. All righty. Any last questions, things you want to ask me? Um, questions about React, questions about the app, questions about web development, questions about SQL, anything at all. It's all good. I'd like to leave a few minutes at the end for questions. If there are any, they're not, there's not always questions. That's okay. <laughs> Build an API to find out how many Pokemon APIs are there. There's probably a lot. Although the official one is pretty robust. Oh, there's also a really good, um, uh, I, a long time ago, if you're interested in building APIs, um, a long time ago, I built a Star Trek API, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, Dev Philipper says, have you, uh, have you much experience with Tailwind? A little bit, not a ton. Uh, I have more experience with Bootstrap, um, but I have done a stream on Tailwind if you're interested in getting an introduction to it. Uh, I did do a stream on Tailwind a couple months ago. It'll be on my YouTube channel uh, if you search for Tailwind. It should come up. Um, we kind of just did a like a exploration of some of what Tailwind can do. Uh, and I think, I can't remember if we did it with React or not. Uh, Zape says, do you know Ruby? I do not. Um, I know SQL and, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, that sort of thing. And a little bit of uh, Visual Basic, but not a ton. I've actually not been a developer for very long. 
um, I was an analyst for a long time working with SQL, but in a, like in an analytics capacity, basically just doing read only type operations. Um, but yeah, I've only been a developer for less than two years, but I've learned a lot in that short time. And I've only been working with JavaScript for a year, maybe. Yeah, I think so. It's about right. So you can, you can pick up a lot in a short time if it's something that you enjoy, right? And also anybody can be a developer too. You don't have to have a CS background. It, all you have to do is like to code. Um, I don't have a CS background. And uh, I, I used to think I couldn't be a developer because I didn't have a CS degree, but that is absolutely not true. And anybody can do this stuff. So that's why, you know, free, free services like 100 devs and like all these wonderful Twitch streamers out here that's why they generate the, the content that they do to bring people into the industry who don't have that piece of paper that says computer science on it. Yeah, absolutely, Zabe. So who knows, maybe I will learn Ruby someday. That's the cool thing about tech is that there's always something new to learn, right? Um, you're never gonna run out of things. If you're ever, if you're ever the, um, the, the smartest or the most knowledgeable person in the room, you know, you're probably in the wrong room because that means you're not learning anything. Y'all in chat teach me stuff all the time, right? I think I learned like two or three new things just listening to chat today. <laughs> all righty, well, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and start to wrap things up for the day. Um, thank you all for sticking with me for this entire thing. I know this was a long one, but I think it was a fun one, and I hope you agree. Um, the VOD will be available on my Twitch channel for uh, 60 days, um, but prior to it expiring, um, I, will move, uh, I will move the VOD over to YouTube, so you'll, it's never going to go away forever. Um, you'll be able to view it on YouTube anytime, ad-free. Uh, along with all the rest of my archive. Um, also, my GitHub is out there for anybody that wants to look at, you know, if you're ever watching one of my streams and you're like, oh, I want to build something with that code, that would be great. But I don't want to sit through the whole stream and like build it, you know, piece by piece. I would just like to have the code and build something with it. Well, go out to my GitHub, exclamation point GitHub in chat. Um, go out there, find the, the matching repo uh, for whatever stream you're watching. Um, and then take the code. It's yours. That's why it's out there. That's why my GitHub is public. So you can just do stuff with that. Um, so yeah, take it, enjoy, build something cool. Oh, thank you, Zafe. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming. <laughs> but yeah, that's why the GitHub is out there. I'll just go ahead and uh, there you go. Check it out. Take the code, build something cool. The only thing I ask is that if you do build something cool, please tag me on Twitter, at MayanWolf on Twitter, um, or Threads. I'm on there too, I guess. Um, tag me there. <laughs> tag me wherever. And uh, show me what you made, because I want to see it. I'm sure it'll be great. Alrighty. Well, let's go ahead and find somebody, some, somebody to raid. Yeah, no worries, Dev. Thanks for coming today. Let's find a raid person. Who is online today? Ooh, okay. We've got some good choices. We've got Acorn1010, uh, Juicebox Hero, Team Vash. Ooh, let's raid Juicebox Hero. They raided me last time, so I'd love to pay them back. They are super fun. Um, they're actually a Twitch employee, right? They work for Twitch, don't they? Juicebox? Um, and yeah, they're, they're a ton of fun. They're amazing. Um, love to see what they're working on. So let's check out Juicebox and see what they're up to. It looks like they are coding. So I think that'll be a great raid target. I will see you all next weekend. We're going to build something fun. I don't know what it is, but that's part of the fun is the surprise. Think about what you want to name a foster kitten if that's your fancy. Um, and if you got the channel points to spend, four of them need names. So I'm counting on you, Twitch chat. Let's go. All right. Raid starting now.
<laughs> Thank you guys. I hope you all have a great week as well. I will see you all next Sunday. Bye-bye.